Hello and welcome to Beyond Boundaries. My name is Justin Douglas and I am so pumped to have you with me today on this episode of Beyond Boundaries. If you want to learn more about me or find the show notes for this episode, you can go to pastorjustindouglas.com. You can interact there with feedback, comments, and questions, or you can reach out via Instagram. I'm at Pastor Justin Douglas. Also, please consider subscribing, rating, reviewing, and sharing. It really does make a difference, and I'm very thankful. On this episode of Beyond Boundaries, I sit down with Brendan Acebo and we talk theology. Brendan is an amazing young leader and thinker in the church. We talked through his theological journey and experience. We talked about atonement theory and our concerns with penal substitutionary atonement. We talked about nonviolence and enemy love. We talked about grace and judgment and much, much more. You will find that we are largely answering two questions throughout this uh, podcast. Who is God and is God angry? Maybe these are questions you've pondered at times. Hope you find the conversation helpful. Brendan and I are going to talk theology a little bit. Brendan, do you want to uh, tell people a little bit about who you are? Yeah, definitely. Uh, my name is Brendan Acebo. I am a recent graduate of Lancaster Bible College and Capital Seminary, and uh, graduated with a degree in worship arts, which is sort of a Bible degree, and it's a music degree. And it's also somehow neither of those things. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, and I, I came out of um, a couple years in the House of Prayer movement and sort of that more um, kind of charismatic side of things. Uh, sure. I went to a school of ministry when I was just out of high school for a year um, called Harvest Net School of Ministry. I think they've changed the name by now. It was in its earlier days then, and that was more oriented around leadership development. Mm. Um but really, the amount of life that happened while I was in Bible college and the environment that I was in, which was pretty hostile. Yeah. Um, that was an education of its own yeah. in some ways, right? Like outside of the classroom. Oh, absolutely. And um, I have a great and terrible difficulty with authority in general. And so there are some ways where, like, I have to die to that and I have to submit. Sure. And uh, blessed are those who make it easy for me to do so, <laughs> you know. But, uh, but then when it came to, like, certain sort of maybe theological positions that were really popular mm -hmm. um, in college, uh, for example, if you were intellectual at all, you had to be a five-point Calvinist. Yeah. If you were intellectual at all, you had basically... Just a really shallow list. It was like um, Tim Keller, who I think is pretty great still, but uh, oh, yeah, or course, John man. Piper, and um, I don't even know if you, if you even said Karl Barth, like it was like Beetlejuice. Like if you said his name three times, <laughs> you know, you might all of a sudden become a liberal and oh, go to hell. Oh, man. So it was like it, but in that environment, starting to have to question things. Sure. For myself. Um, led me into a place that uh, we popularly call deconstruction now. And I don't think I knew that that's what I was doing. I think I thought my life was falling apart and I was very possibly going to lose my faith. But the problem was that I knew that I believed in God personally because yeah. I do have a personal relationship with God that I, I, I mean... I don't know that I ever really tried to walk away, walk away, but I, I definitely shelved it for about a month or so of my life, um, yeah. a summer several years ago, and just said, I'm out of that context, I'm sure. out of that world, and one day as an experiment, I sort of picked up my guitar, and I started singing a song that I used to sing in church, and I had an experience of the presence of God that hmm. was so sweet and so um, loving, and I just was like, all right, well, I know you're real to me, you know? And th there's yeah. been more... It moves beyond the, yeah. like, knowledge of a textbook or the scientific, like, yeah. reality, and it's more like, man, this is something that's real. Yeah, like, so you're subjective, and yeah. you're, we're constantly, we're subjective beings, and we're constantly moving into these subjective realities, which is where 
that conviction lives Mm -hmm. and where it compels you and changes you in that subjective space where to the outside it's like, well, no, I can't prove to you that I feel like the voice of the Lord just, you know, moved me in a certain way. But if I deny it, I will implode because it is that real to me. Sure. And so having a, a subjective faith that is just getting beaten up objectively by all of these different ideas and all of Mm. these different frameworks for understanding God, God's sovereignty, atonement. Those are really big ones for me. Mm -hmm. And finally just being like, all these cards are falling around me. It it felt like um, if I had tried for the longest time to sort of stay somebody's hand from pulling that Jenga block that was going to make all of them come down, well... One day I realized it's already gone and this has actually already fallen down. Sure. And if I'm going to put it back together the way that it was, I'm going to have to be pretty certain. Not, I'm going to have to... Have to have actually examined each of the blocks that go in there. Absolutely. Whereas a lot of times we start to just throw blocks on because people have told us that's the block you Yeah. That's the block you have if you're following Jesus. Well, and you think to yourself like, would you rather feel like you know who Satan is and what he does and how he fell and all the lore? Yeah. Would you rather have that and have that intact so that you can order other things, your other like sort of cosmologies around that? Or would you rather say like, actually, I don't know a whole lot about Satan. I don't think <laughs> we do in general. And I don't think that that gets to be one of the base blocks for this sure. Jenga house anymore. Sure. And a lot, for a lot of people, that's uh, what you described there is something that's at the foundation. Now, would you say in your college experience, it was pretty fundamentalist, dogmatic? Obviously, there's probably institutions that are even more fundamentalist and more dogmatic. Oh, but sure. Would you say that was your experience? Pretty, n- not a whole lot of freedom to... Yeah, there wrestle were, with ideas, but more a sense of like this is the idea that we authorize. And yeah, this is the way we yeah. ex- understand it. Well, there are definitely um, they don't want to be considered fundamentalist. Of course not. No one wants to. But whatever the fundamentalists are, never want to be considered yeah, fundamentalist. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so uh, I remember taking um, uh, it was supposed to be like a church history mm-hmm. course called Christianity and Culture. And the course that I took was basically Christianity, Christian thought, starting maybe in the beginnings of what they would call theological liberalism Okay. Um, in like the late 1800s, mm-hmm. and then moving up to present day. And so I thought fundamentalism was more a position on rejecting the outside world and just kind Mm of cocooning and uh, judging from over here instead of living with other people. And then evangelicalism was supposed to be the answer to that problem. Yeah, a lot of people don't know this. I mean, and and nowadays, obviously, evangelical has all kinds of things attached to it. But if you're listening, you don't know the history, like evangelicalism was supposed to be the answer to fundamentalism. It was supposed to be the answer to, to that. And now for many people, depending upon who you are, uh, evangelicalism is the new fundamentalism. Like absolutely. It, it would seem so at least. Absolutely. And it's funny because I could totally imagine a hundred years ago, a fundamentalist preacher saying, you know, you know, if you start square dancing on Saturday nights, the next thing you know, <laughs> in 100 years, you're going to have Christians that believe the government should be providing birth control for, like, you know, unwed people or something like that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, and, and they'd be right. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, yeah, actually, no, it is tipping that way. I just think But that, maybe we were going there anyway. <laughs> yeah. And it had and, nothing to do with square dancing. <laughs> yeah. And maybe square dancing, <laughs> maybe square dancing is just, like, a decent way to spend your Saturday. <laughs> It, when there's nothing else going on, you know yeah, what I mean. Exactly. Uh, I mean, it's just um, there are just so many things in evangelicalism that you can't question. Yeah. Uh, and we're supposed to be these open people that I mean, the first time I ever heard somebody say, "I love Jesus, but I hate religion," it was an evangelical, and they're mm. incredibly religious and dogmatic, and yeah. but they don't necessarily see it that way. 
Mm. But that, but then when you start to challenge them, start challenge, start challenging people on their right to violence. Start challenging them on their idea of God as retributively just. Like he, his idea of justice is basically a divine getting even. Yeah. Which even just the idea that God has to break even is yeah is such a um, as a very like. It's a product of modernity, I would God say. God has to do something evil in order to do something good, which is very fascinating to me. Yeah. Like, but it's not evil because God's doing it. And yeah. like, then you just get into this very ethical... It's good because he says it's gray, good, even though we know it's bad. Like gray, gray ethically. And you're like, this is not the Edenic ideal, which, you know what I mean? This is not God in the garden that I'm seeing here. Um, yeah. And even God in the garden at the, you know, after the fall, you have... Certainly, God um, acting in a way of justice, right? And, and mm-hmm. saying, okay, I, I said this would happen and this is happening now, but then he's also making them clothing. There's this gracious reality to, to, to God desiring to cover their shame, right? And then even when you have the first murderer, there's still God showing grace and putting a mark on him so he's not killed. Like, And you're just like, this doesn't square... Mm-hmm. With a God who seemingly is consistently uh, looking for opportunities to step into pretty extreme places where he could exert his wrath mm-hmm. and instead is often relenting. And then ultimately, and whatever you believe about the Old Testament is ultimately relenting in Jesus. Mm-hmm. Like re- sending Jesus, like this is a, this is a, Mm-hmm. you know, a game changer, a plot twist moment, you know, to the whole story. Um, so, okay. So there were three topics predominantly that I think you listed that, mm-hmm. that kind of sent you sideways in college then that did that happen like your freshman year, your sophomore year? Or, um, what, what, or was there a particular year or was it just like a scale that just kind of kept sliding? I think it kept sliding because my faith for me, as I was going through some of my own just my own struggles in life, um, some relationships that went pretty horribly, and a couple other things too. Uh, uh, also, discovering that I needed, like, I was a person that needed counseling, yeah, and that actually I ended up needing to be prescribed something to help my mm-hmm. brain just be chemically balanced so that I could, so that I, I like, I, the most simple way of putting it is so that life seem possible again. I like guess sure. just the difference. It's to change my personality. Just like mm-hmm. life seems possible. Yeah. It seems plausible that I could make it to 40 and not be a complete failure and hate myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like that shift. So, so you in, had a lot going on yeah. personally. Yeah. That probably had a little bit to do with influencing the- theology because sure. I would say whenever we're having to reconsider our identity in other areas, it often influence what I find is well, most it's like people, the exile. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> most people who have a crisis of theology are typically having to reinterpret their identity somewhere else too. Yeah. Like very true. They're, they're, they're having to come to some grips with a relationship that was lost, uh, a, a failure, a death, Things, uh, yeah. loss of a job, mm. uh, move to a whole new state, have to make all new friends or, you know, whatever uh, there's, there's some other thing that, is also happening and then there's this pressure of like rebirth and that's happening over here and then you kind of get this vision for the fact that rebirth is possible in other areas too and I don't know that you know that consciously I think it's probably very subconscious but most yeah. people I meet who are going on some deconstruction path or who are really questioning there's also a lot that's shifting in their life in other places so it seems like you kind of weren't just the college student who had everything stable and then no, was just going to college. Yeah. There were other <laughs> moving parts. It wasn't, it definitely wasn't working. And one of the reasons that it wasn't working is because I've always been a very critical questioning person. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, like, if I ask you a question, it's not because I don't want to believe you and I want to prove to you that I shouldn't have to believe you by making you like yeah. look stupid or something. It's not like that at all. I always would say like, no, I want to believe you, but I, I want to believe you confidently. I want and to know why. I need to have something. And uh, you can't just cry mystery, mystery when you find out that, like, your God is an ethical monster. And that's like a really yeah. loaded thing to say. But the, I think the first 
big piece of the puzzle that fell for me was a friend of mine who had been and is still like one of the most brilliant people that I know and one of the strangest people that I know. Uh, <laughs> hey, yeah, I wish I could get into that. But he he challenged me. He showed me um, a debate, and actually not a very good debate, but it's a debate between Brian Zond mm. and uh, I think it's Dr. Michael Brown. Okay. Um, and it was done at the International House of Prayer in Kansas City. Like, I think it was held during one oh. of their conferences or something. It was on the big stage, and it was called the Monster God Debate. Oh, wow. And Zahn did that, huh? Yeah. Yeah, and, and Zahn has an amazing book out now that people should go read, which is Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God, right? Yeah. Is that, I mean, which is obviously a play on West Sinners in the Burger. Hand of an uh, Angry God. Yeah, popular, Jonathan Edwards, right? Yeah, the popular uh, sermon preached in the fundamentalist era of... Yeah. You know, faith, but go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you watched that debate, huh? So I watched the debate a couple times, and my problem was all of Brian's arguments were compelling and convicting and pointing towards something else, but all of uh, Dr. Brown's arguments were very much, yeah, but this text says this, and this text says that, and for my upbringing, it was like, well okay, he's got to be right because he's got the Bible on his side, never mind if he's got the Word of God on his side. You know, he's yeah. got these texts that are proving this, and it really that that formula for penal substitution, It, if you're comfortable reading the Bible pretty literally on a surface level and you're comfortable not asking certain questions, mm-hmm. um, it's pretty compelling until you start to see how much else is out there and maybe how people used to look at this yeah before atonement became a game of divine accounting sure. you know what i mean so so let's do it this way the the yeah. three topics you, you had mentioned yeah. were atonement mm-hmm. uh was it violence was that one or yeah what, what i did it? mention violence i think it's atonement and violence Oh, sovereignty, 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 yeah. atonement, yeah, yeah. sovereignty, atonement, mm-hmm. and violence. Is that is yeah? That, so, so let's start with atonement, just mm-hmm. because you kind of just mentioned it with yeah. With Zond, describe what you were taught about atonement growing up. Like, if there's a lay person that oh, doesn't yeah, have totally. like a theological background, how would you say most evangelicals understand atonement? Right. Okay. So the most important thing is. God loves the world. Mm-hmm. John three sixteen. Right, Send but you messed it up mm-hmm. for yourself, and now you deserve to die. Yep. Um, and actually, you deserve capital punishment. Like mm. you deserve for God to execute you. And this goes all the way back to the garden, the banishing. Yeah. Uh, like death is part of our story right. now because of our right. fallen nature. Totally. So like because of the fall of people and because of our own conscious choices in rebellion against God, I think R.C. Sproul calls it cosmic treason. Sure. Okay, well, you know, deserters will be shot. Like, yeah, you've committed this act of treason against God through your sin and you inherited it because of Adam, but you also chose it yourself because... Yeah. That's what people choose. Mm-hmm. Like, it's what we do. And then Jesus comes in in the nick of time to say, I'm going to die the death that they should die mm-hmm. so that God can see that when God looks at them, he sees me. I'm going to put them in myself. So God's going to have mercy on them, but it's not even really mercy on them so much as he's satisfied. Like, God needs a sacrifice yeah. in order to forgive. And so if he gets a good enough sacrifice, he can theoretically forgive everybody. Everyone. But the, only if they follow Jesus, but which only, is the other thing. Right. Like, it's, a, it's only a forgiveness they, that's only... Only if they believe in Jesus yeah. mm-hmm. and only if they call him... Like, it has to be like Lord in Christ, mm-hmm. which... Okay, great. Whatever. I, I'm... Pretty cool with that, but like the I mean yeah. the idea of that's who he is, yeah. And it has to be before you bite the bullet on this life, like you you, you don't get a you don't get chance. there is no, no yeah post mortem reconciliation reconciliation yeah no 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 so and we don't even think of it we call it reconciliation, 
but it's it's really not. And that that was one of the tough things was realizing a debt paid is not a debt forgiven. Yeah. There's a big difference between uh, Jesus' parable of the two men that both owe debts of various sums of money to the king, and he forgives them both, right? Mm -hmm. Because that leads you to believe that you know, not a cent was added to the king's treasury on their account, even though he had spent all this money on them. That because mm -hmm. it was in his power to forgive them, and because they recognized that they needed forgiveness, he could just extend it. Yeah. But that's not, that's not the atonement theory that I was brought up with. It was like the whole penal substitutionary atonement. You should die. Jesus dies for you. God should kill you, but God kills Jesus instead of you. And of course we participate, but you can almost not blame us for it because it's what God needed to have happen in order to forgive us. Yeah, and that that whole theory also is is the model for evangelism for most the way most people are taught to package uh, the the gospel. I mean, when you think of some of the street evangelists, the first thing they're going to tell you is that you deserve death. Like that that's going to be very early on in the, are mm -hmm. you a sinner? Have you ever sinned? Have you ever told a lie? Oh, I love it. Well, you've told yeah, a lie. What, who, what's that. his name? What's, what's I forget that? his name. He's got that. It's Ray, Ray something. Yeah. Ray something. But I, uh, yeah, but he, and I think like Kirk Cameron does it with him sometimes. And so they go out in the street and, and that's the form of evangelism I was taught under. And, and I would even say like the, the way in which I was brought up to understand the atonement. And I would say the hard thing here is is that there are like you said verses that, that 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 talk about this and that that seem to lean on this analogy i think part of the struggle is in the ancient world sacrifice was so built into the dna of how to understand god and god seems to leverage that image mm -hmm. um because that's an image that's known and so it's a relevant image but I, I think it's that, also a good reminder if we think to ourselves that sin has a death consequence, mm -hmm. which I completely affirm. Yes. But I say death consequence, death penalty, uh, you can use them interchangeably, but I, I prefer to say it's a death consequence. And like I would say the wrath of God is the inherent death of sin. It's what happens when you are not spared from the inherent consequences of your own actions. So you're more okay. punished by your sins than for your sins. Something you do to yourself, not something God's actively doing right. to you. Exactly. Which is so easy to see when you look at brokenness in the world. You you can often I mean there's so much self inflicted pain. If you've ever journeyed with someone who's addicted, who's, mm -hmm. you know, who any number of things that could go down a list and like um you can see the self-infliction of the pain that they're journeying through. No one has to say someone did this to you. Now, there may be other influencers and other factors, right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't, you can still see the, the reality that there's a certain level of bringing this on yourself kind of, right? Right. Now, and, and so, so would, I be, would it be fair and accurate, or, and maybe we're, we're both not, the best judges of this, obviously we don't have someone who's an advocate for penal substitutionary atonement in the room, but like, let's say God has a gun in his hand mm -hmm. and he's got it aimed at humanity. Right. And Jesus steps in the way and God pulls the trigger and kills Jesus. Is that a pretty basic, like just zero sum understanding of penal substitution to a degree, right? Honestly, so that I'm so disappointed to say that. Yeah. But it's like, kind of, unfortunately, that view of evil does not bring into account um, principalities of powers, darkness, anything like that. Oh, yeah. how does Jesus overcome like sin, death, and the devil? Uh, well, also by dying for us, but oh, wait, I thought he was dying for us because God needed him to, to forgive us. Well, that too, but you know, he's doing, and like, it just, the idea is it really God confuses had a... the issue of what Jesus is accomplishing yeah. and what he's overcoming and how he's bringing us into that and, and how actually the clearest picture of God is Christ on the cross. It's not 
the, the clearest picture of God is the father turning his face away from Jesus while he suffers. Yeah. And the idea that when Jesus said um, on the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Like, I think I was raised to believe that God shook his head and was like, you're too nice. Really? As opposed to agreeing. Wow. And being like, of course we want to forgive them. Yeah. Um, and that... Yeah, and, and instead, imagine um, imagine God, like in that picture that we're talking about. God is one party, humanity's holding the gun, and we're holding the gun to our own head. Yeah. And Jesus steps in to intervene, mm. and we kill him. And then God raises him from the dead, and then we lay our guns down at the feet of Jesus. And that, like, and, and we're brought into this family, you know? Yeah. And that, that's a different picture than, you know, God needing to be satisfied by violence. And I, I think what well, Brian Zahn is one of the people that have advocated this, but uh, yeah. there's just so many that do a great job of it. The idea, um, I think Rene Girard is a pretty big one too, but, like, that, the idea of... A God that's satisfied by any kind of bloodshed is Mm -hmm. not the God of the Old Testament, even. It's like the God of the ancient Near East. Like, that's how they understood it. Yeah. You know? It's the God. And and to say that, that would be like the God of the Old Testament is what we're really referencing there, right? Like, Or the God of the Old Testament, meaning like the pagan gods and the pagan... Right. I mean, I guess what what I would say is like, because what you have to reference here with this particular part of the story is the game-changing moment that Jesus is. Mm-hmm. So, 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 so I went through a very similar experience with atonement yeah. theory. And I would actually say it was partially atonement theory, but it had more just to do with, I don't think I know who God is anymore. Hmm. Because I, I can't believe these things about God, these things that have been attributed to God. And here, here's a great example. Um, I believe it was the Newtown school shootings happened. Oh, wow. And um, I was in a Reformed community at the time. I was serving as a pastor in a Reformed community. And a very popular Reformer, I just won't even say his name, um, came out and said that God, uh, it was for God's glory that that happened. And, And I was like, whoa. Whoa, but then I paused and thought about it, and I'm like, that is the logical conclusion for where we are going. If, I mean, and obviously we're getting into sovereignty and stuff, but like the view I had of God and what He does um, was really challenged at that moment, and then it just unraveled. And as it unraveled, Mm-hmm. And if anybody's in that moment right now or, or has, has journeyed through that and still hasn't had much of a reconstruction, because I do think the church of the next 10 to 20 years is going to be a church that hopefully uh, can lean into what it looks like to reconstruct for those people who are deconstructing or doubting mm-hmm. and give them, give them handles, but also give them a variety of handles. That, does that make sense? Like not just here, let me give you, let me give you a new fundamentalism. Yeah, let on me my give side, you another house of cards. Let me give you another house of cards. It'll just fall in another 20 years after you've you know invested everything in it, and then you're going to have another crisis of faith. Instead, like mm-hmm. really encouraging people to discern for themselves. Like One of the things I like at the bridge is when people are like, you're just making it too difficult. I, can you just tell me what to believe? <laughs> it's like, good. That means I'm doing my job if you're asking that yeah, question. Totally. Because I'd rather you have to actually discern. But anyway, Hebrews 1.3, just yeah. like between the eyes hit me. And like, if you don't know that passage, it says Jesus is the full radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. And I paused there and I was like, huh. And I definitely had some others speaking into my life at that time. I think I was, you know, listening to Greg Boyd and Bruxy Cavey and and they were, they were uh, certainly influencers, but that, that verse, when I, when I really got a hold of it and started considering what it's saying, it's at the very start of Hebrews, mm-hmm. which is very interesting, right? This book mm-hmm. that's... And it's the book that deals the most that, 
with, okay, how do we look at sacrifice yep, in the Old exactly. Testament in the context of Jesus? So, yes. So it, and yeah. it's, and it's the third verse in the book, which means it's, it's, it's intentionally here. It's literally after the greeting or whatever. And then bam, this ver- opening verse that's kind of setting the whole foundation and stage for where this book is going and how it's to be understood and interpreted. And what I find fascinating is that it says Jesus is the exact representation of God to man. Mm-hmm. And it's saying it in a book that's written predominantly to Jews to understand Jesus's place, right? Mm-hmm. And what it's really saying when it says exact representation is, hey, maybe God hasn't been exactly represented to you. Absolutely. Not that you haven't seen God, but maybe you haven't seen God exactly. Well, and that's kind of the same thing that John's doing at the beginning of his gospel when he says, yeah. uh, no one's seen God at any time. And, uh, you know, it would be very easy to say, but well, John, don't you remember the book of Isaiah? You know, Isaiah yeah. sees God seated on the throne. Or what about the other prophets? Or, or what about what about Moses? You know, God yeah. like, causes goodness to pass before him and mm-hmm. hit him in a rock or something, which... It's always been strange to me, yeah. but still, like, what about all this we stuff? We have a character who wrestled with God. Yeah, what about Literally. Sinai? Yeah. What about Abraham when, yeah. like, he basically, it, it seems like the Trinity looks like people, and they show up, and they tell uh, Abraham's wife that she's going to have a son. Like, now, what yeah. about that, John? What do you have to say about that? And he would say, don't tell me how to read the Bible. <laughs> I know the Bible, but let me tell you what you don't know, which is Jesus. Yeah. And he is God and he is just like him. So like, I was trying to explain this to a friend of mine just the other night. And I just said, look, if you were going to, if I said, paint me a picture of the sun and, Mm -hmm. uh, I gave you two photographs to use and one was a cloudy day and you could see some rays of light peeking through. Mm -hmm. And the other one was just a picture of the sun on a cloudless day, clear and shining as full strength. Which one would be more helpful to you? And it's like, of course, the one that's less obstructed. Yeah. But it's... It, wow, that's a good image. Yeah, but it takes a lot of humility to say, it's okay that it was obstructed to some extent before. It's okay that there are images of God in the Old Testament that have um, some truth, but not the full truth that is Jesus. Yeah. That there are just missing pieces and that also God might allow himself to be misunderstood by people. And that that doesn't mean that the Bible doesn't work. God might also say people can't fully understand me in a sacrificial system, Mm -hmm. but a sacrificial system is the best way they can understand me right now. Yeah. And that's right. Like they can't fully understand me in this place, but this is the best way they can understand me in a pagan world with all of these pagan, you know, Mm -hmm. idol worshiping tribes around them. And then you also have like prior to the Noah story, it's like the, the earth was more violent than it had ever been. Like this, this violent understanding of like, it's like God's entering into quite the mess and -hmm. trying to give some handles. And I would say like, when I'm talking to someone who's deconstructing their faith, I'm not going to tell them everything I believe about God. Does that make sense? Like, are you, are you going to give them like, here's the exact picture you have to believe about God, or here's the exact picture. No. I, I mean, even when I was a fundamentalist or I lead, not, not, not that I necessarily was a fundamentalist, but when I was in that camp, I wouldn't even give them all the beliefs that I held. Right. I would say like, what's most important here. And yeah. it seems like God's really starting to talk <laughs> about covering our need for a savior, our, our need for our need for God, our need to be mm-hmm. in relationship to God. These are all themes that Jesus... And we need uh, a way of understanding reconciliation to God yep. or some kind of... A note. We need to have something that assures us that our relationship with Him is intact. Yeah. I think the sacrificial system does that to mm-hmm. an extent. Yeah. But how much more the assurance of the Holy Spirit, you know? Um, it. I think the big difference you're talking about are you going to tell somebody exactly the picture that you feel like they need to have of God? Yeah. Uh, one, it's very hard for me to not just sort of start throwing up everywhere. Yeah. When I start talking, because it's like, oh, it's connected to everything. No, no, yeah. no, no. And you should rethink violence. And also you should rethink like your cosmology and you have to understand. And it's like, yeah. oh my goodness. No, it's just, it's too much. It's overwhelming. The difference is everything that I present to people now like the focus is 
God is as good as he's revealed to be in Christ. He's as beautiful as he's revealed to be in Christ. This is the gospel to me. God is and has always been just like Jesus. Exactly. And we can trust that. But when I would have been sharing the gospel before, because I had like great zeal for evangelism when I was younger, probably like in middle school and early high school, I used to like lead groups of people my age and we would just like walk the streets. Nobody told us to, but we would like want to pray for people. We'd want to talk to people about Jesus and Mm -hmm. all this stuff, you know? Um, And in those cases, it always felt like we were holding back God's shadow side. We were keeping that part close to the chest. Okay. Where like, Eventually, you're going to have to find out that God really does want to kill you. Or eventually, you're going to have to find out that, like, you know, God is comfortable sending most people who've ever existed to a place of eternal conscious torment. Or eventually, you're going to have to reconcile with this. But I want to bring you in. It's like the love of God is the hook. It's like the worm on the hook, right, to get you in. And then you find out once it's in and once you've accepted it, oh, spiritual maturity is actually coming to terms with the fact that God's not nearly as nice as he seems in Jesus. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. And the rest of what God is is tough love, bud. You know what I mean? And like (laughs) tough love is what we call it when we can't in good conscience even call it love. (laughs) Or what I find is fascinating is we, we, we encourage people to embrace the mystery when it comes to God's violence or God's moral um, ambiguity. When, when you think God might be doing something evil, it's like, well, it's just a mystery. But when it's like, when, when you come on the side of saying, well, hold on, everything changed with Jesus, and now God is no longer this way because uh, we've seen him fully... They're like, well, that's not something I can accept. Like, there, there's just this very interesting like, thing of like, what about mystery? Yeah, yeah. Because then it's like, but we can't embrace mystery on that side, or we call mystery on that side heresy. But mystery on this side seems to be the only way to get Oops. God off the hook for all of these, all of these things that would, uh, for most people, uh, faith or no faith, if they really objectively looked at it, would be like, wow, this person or this being is a, is a moral monster. Yeah, I mean, because because just the hell conversation. Not that we're going to dive into it right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, we can. I, we're we're just kind of riffing on any theological topics and certainly things that are connected to you personally. But like the hell conversation, probably the most interesting thing about that is like, can you really argue that a human being that lives, let's say, a long life, a hundred years, mm-hmm. can sin enough in a hundred years to deserve eternity in conscious torment? Like the the moral equivalency there, like, is fascinating. Right, and just honestly saying. Um you could spend, I don't know, did you, did you ever see the movie Bronson? No. It's a weird movie. It's one of the weirdest movies I've ever seen. <laughs> it's Tom Hardy, and he just, like, beats the hell out of people okay. in prison. Like, the whole movie <laughs> is just him being a bad dude, <laughs> and just, it's it's ridiculous. Okay. I'm only, I'm only kind of glad that I saw it once, just because it's such an odd thing. Oh, but, like... Man. You could live that life for, let's say, a hundred years. So a hundred years of just being the baddest, worst that you could possibly be, or you could spend a hundred years, like, just saying, "I really don't know about everything else. I'm gonna try to be a family man, and you know, mm-hmm. do right by my family or my kids, or you know, I have I have no idea. I'm gonna serve my country however I can, or I'm gonna whatever, like, just normal things." And uh, and just be like, yeah, so you both equally deserve just the rotisserie of eternity. Like, yeah. you, you, you're going to be on the spit right next to Hitler and right next to Anne Frank, by the way, because she was a Jew. So they're the God killers. And, like, all yeah. of them are just... And you're like, boy, that... what What is really more unjust to you? The idea that, like... Adolf Hitler and Anne Frank could be chilling in the same cell in hell forever and ever, amen, or the idea that you could be in the presence of the mercy of God and you could look over to your left and there's Adolf Hitler weeping at the feet of Jesus. Like, to me, like, which one's more unjust? Which God is more unjust? Yeah. And I would say, if God's going to be, you know unjust in the sense of he's not going to get even where mm-hmm. he deserves to get even 
Let's do it on the side of mercy, not on the side of retribution. Well, and this is also a God who fully revealed in Jesus tells us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Yeah. And then also is one who restores and reconciles the first terrorist against the church. Mm-hmm. So like the idea of, of the redemption of someone like Hitler, while that certainly because our entire social construct is built up on Hitler being the extreme for what it means yeah. to be morally corrupt. The right? archetype of evil. Sure. Exactly. So, so like the idea that God would redeem that, I think we just have so many social cues that push us against that. Right. But like, I, I think that's the, the question becomes like, why, why are we uncomfortable with God's grace? Like, yeah. and, 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 and we're afraid of how much we need it. We're afraid of how much we need it personally. We're afraid of who gets it. The people that have hurt us, right? Like I, I, justice becomes really important when here's a great example. Mm-hmm. Justice becomes really important when the person cuts you off in traffic and then you see the sirens, the police sirens, and they pull over the guy who cut you off. Oh, yeah. And you're like, yeah, you get what you deserve. You, you cut me off, you punk. This, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, mm-hmm. Or have you ever had someone speed by you at like 80 miles per hour and, 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 and you you're in a cop. 55 yeah. and then you see a cop get him? When everyone who drives by that after they see that guy it's that like, just got oh, pulled over, guy. they're like, this guy, he got him. See? Because I was obeying the law and he was going way too fast. Or I was only going five over and he was going way too yeah, far over yeah, or whatever. Yeah. You know, you, and then the thing is, the moment you get pulled over, you're like, oh, God, please, please. Please let the officer have grace. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, oh, give me the mercy. Whole, the whole thing shifts. And it's like, that's like a microcosm for how we see God in our own life too. Like when I fail, it's like, God, please, I need to be reassured that your grace is for me in this moment because mm. I really messed up. Yeah. But then when someone else messes up, it can be like, you get what you deserve, man. You... uh you failed. You, you messed up. You, yeah. you did the wrong thing. Like, and you need the consequence. You need the full consequence because that's the only way you're going to learn. Or that, I mean, however yeah. you want to, you, you want to, so oh. we, we become very uncomfortable with grace for other people, but very comfortable with grace for ourselves. And the interesting thing about hell, probably the most interesting thing about hell is the theology of it is so fascinating because as you, as you're a follower of Jesus and whatever you believe about hell is actually a belief you hold for someone else, not a belief you hold for yourself. I love the idea at, who is it, boy, I wish I could remember who said this. Who said, the only person you should be able to imagine in hell is yourself. Mm. I was just like, Mm. oh, no. Oh, but I've got an assurance of hope and pardon and all this stuff. But, but yeah, like, Mm. it, it should be my reconciliation with God that I'm imagining, not everybody else's, like, with, yeah, I don't know. It Well, atonement, what's interesting is atonement intersects with violence, nonviolence, that whole argument. Mm-hmm. It intersects with hell, heaven, reconciliation and, you know, eternal conscious torment. What what's our what's our thoughts there? Right. It it intersects with how grace even happens. Like there's just all kinds of places where atonement, right? So like you you walked away from penal substitutionary atonement. That was difficult. That was a hard yeah. thing to walk away from. What did you walk into, Ooh, like atonement is, theory wise? Yeah, like, yeah, because yeah, there's yeah. a variety of different atonement theories it got, out there. It's gotten bigger and bigger. Yeah, exactly. Um, like there's so much now. Like I, I would say, my view of the atonement is so much bigger than it ever was. Yeah, it's a myriad it's, of sorts, right? right? Because, because there's a variety right. of. So, like the the premier one that I would say I'm probably the most comfortable championing Mm -hmm. is like the idea of Christus Victor. Yeah. Do you want to unpack that for a little bit? Yeah. And totally correct me if I do it wrong. No, go ahead. But this is how I understand it. Sure. Like Christ on the cross sort of absorbs our own evil that we're manifesting against him. Mm -hmm. He takes on himself the sin of the, the world. The sin of the world, exactly. The burden ever since, if we want to look at the story of Adam and Eve in the fall, mm-hmm. we see it as a shift in dominion mm-hmm. where like, if God gave them dominion over the earth, well, then they forfeited it to um, 
I don't even want to say Satan, but like systems of powers. I don't know. Lawlessness, you could even say, yeah. however you want. Like, evil. Like there's a, it's there's an evil. evil they, gave it, they gave over the authority, and that's why, you know, the image of the devil or the accuser that we see in um, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, he says, look, kingdoms of the earth are mine to give you. Yeah. And it's because we gave it to him. It's not because God gave it to him. Yeah. We, we legitimately, like, we had authority. We gave it to him. So it's Christ is not only taking on the sins of the world, but he's also winning back the authority over the world mm. that had been invested in humanity and then forfeited. Mm. And, and he's also taking on the power of death itself. And what he does, and I, I believe personally anyways, that he sort of descends into death itself and it's a jailbreak. Yeah. And then he's resurrected and he's inaugurated as the rightful king, like the rightful king of the earth, yeah. the rightful king of the cosmos. And he has this indestructible life to share with with humanity, to yeah. build a new humanity, really. and To build a resurrection yeah. possible humanity. Yeah, totally. And... And victor meaning victory. Yeah. There's a yeah, victory yeah, here Christ over, the victor. over death. Christ has, has, this is less about what God does to Jesus and more about what Jesus does to death. Totally. Is and that the way of like, uh, That's a it? great way of looking at it. Um, and, and then you get everything else that comes into it. When you look at it that way, like Jesus' defeat of violence. I mean, come on. You mm-hmm. talk about justice and injustice. The, the execution of Jesus was unjust. It was a state-sponsored, mm-hmm. brutal killing to satisfy the whims of a mob crowd mm. and some scared religious leaders and some oppressive, tyrannical government. And all of them sort of, uh, I guess the word would be coalesced or whatever, mm-hmm. into this act of violence. And Jesus defeats it. And his resurrection proves that there is a better way. Yeah, a better way than the kingdoms of this world, a better way than the religion of this yeah. world, even the religion and set he, up and by he proves, his father. Yeah, yeah, and he proves those things to be fraudulent. Yeah. Like all of those other systems and powers are fraudulent systems and powers in comparison to the risen Christ. And mm. that means that violence is fraudulent power. Yeah. And... That that means that scapegoating yep. is a fraudulent means of sort of, um, I guess, de-escalating our own sense of um, like our need for violence together. Yeah. You know, getting out our anxiety on this person. So scapegoating is so popular in our world today too, because social media has opened up a whole way of scapegoating, oh, like a it's... whole way of having one person have a have a failure of some kind, or say something the wrong way, or you know, do something wrong. And there's absolutely no mercy or grace for that person. And mm-hmm. the fact that maybe they don't know what they did was wrong, or maybe they come from a different experience than you. And so they've, I mean, you could apply this to or a number of issues. Even, or if they've even admitted what they did was wrong. So yeah. think about the difference between, the difference between um, Kevin Spacey, Louis yeah. C.K., and uh, Harvey Weinstein, because they were all like yeah. sort of um, fell at the same time. Yeah. It all sort of started coming out, which I think, first of all, overall was really necessary 100 percent. we're two for a culture just so you know we're two white male dudes and we're gonna say the me too movement it has yeah. been very helpful yeah. and necessary oh, and yeah. and is that I, whatever we're gonna say next yeah. that, that that's really important yeah yeah totally and so like i can't excuse what any of them have done no but then you've got you look at the difference between it's like harvey weinstein pretty much just denial 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 mm-hmm. um prison and yeah. then you've got uh, they've got Kevin Spacey, who's like, I don't really remember it that way, but you know that's not where I am anymore. And then you've got Louis C.K., who's like, I really messed up. Yeah. Uh, and the response for all of them has been pretty monolithic. It's just like. Yeah, and I would actually say take all them and keep them in that same group. There's yeah. certainly nuances about their approaches mm-hmm. of each of those. But like 
Then throw someone in who sexually harassed someone at work. Oh, geez. now and, and the problem is, is like some of those names are being held in that same scapegoating kind of way as mm-hmm. as others. And I do think there's a social reality to that, but I also think there's a religious reality to that. In like, in 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 Jesus, there there is this like uh, scapegoatedness there that that the religious leaders are are doing. They're like, you know putting it on him. You know what I mean? And, and I, I guess, I guess I would just say like, we, we love to point the finger at someone else. As much as and, we can agree on who to hate, we can get along. Oh man, that's so true. If you want to, if you want to unite people, find a common enemy. And that's, I think part of it is like, mm-hmm. if you, if you can find a common enemy, you can unite a large group of people around that common enemy. I mean, you see presidents do it. You see dictators do it. You see, you see that common enemy fuel war, um, mm-hmm. and and we we tend to lose our rational approach to problem solving when we when we get there. And I don't think it's fair to lump someone who sexually harassed somebody into in to, to use their name in the same sentence as Bill Cosby. Now, what what I would say is that person that doesn't make what that person did right, right? Like, like we're not, we're, totally. it's not, it's not. It's not saying what they did was morally right. I would just say it, it's not what this person did. They're, they're, they're well, different, right? There's and a big difference between they, making an inappropriate comment to exactly. a coworker and being like serially molesting people. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's... Uh, you know, Dave Chappelle actually did a really good job in his most recent stand-up, like talking about the Me Too movement. And like, I'm yeah. sure a lot of people got angry at him because he says things in a very crude way. And uh, I'm not necessarily saying if you... Uh, that you should go listen to that. But I think one of the interesting things he talked about is he, t- I, th- I believe it was him who talked about apartheid um, mm-hmm. in, in Rwanda and, and, and how, how the only way forward through that was actually to, for people to come forward and admit what they had done wrong and for there to be a system of grace established, even in the law, for those people who could come forward and, and in essence say, I was part of a system and a structure that taught me to do this. Mm-hmm. And I grew up in it and I did it even as a grown man and as a grown individual, like, you know what I mean? I, I participated in this. And while I don't know that that's the answer, I don't know what the answer is. Obviously, we veered off course from our, our no, conversation. But, but I you do think... Come cl- but you want to come clean. But you, how do you... Yeah, exactly. Because how do you come clean in a world where you're immediately going to be scapegoated? And I think that's the, Especially if you think that God's... I mean, he wants you to come clean, but his answer is it's okay, I killed my perfect kid for you, so you can come clean. You know what yeah. I mean? It's not, I'm going to forgive you. Yeah. It, it, and and uh, that's why I think if we believe that God acts violently, if we believe that God has a violent hatred for sinners, uh, if we believe that God is sort of, convinced himself not to be as just as he should be and just mm. torch the planet. Mm. You know, like if you, if you have that view of God deep down in your heart, you're not going to have a hard time seeing people around you as your enemies. Yeah, no you're not going to have a hard time done. believing and the worst about anybody. And you're not gonna, yeah, and you're not going to have a hard time withholding mercy. Yeah. Because the truth of the matter is, is that you say, well, you know, it's for God to forgive you, but I can't, you know, well, and and also, I'm not even sure that he wants to. Also, we have this guidepost that is the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And you're looking at this and you're like, hold on, your image of God in penal substitutionary atonement does not seem to be centered on the fruits of the spirit. Right. But you, but basically what ends up happening is you've just got such a shallow, one-sided view of love, and you don't realize... Of course, yeah. And I, I love... It was so funny. Oh, I had a friend... But kindness, yeah. gentleness, yeah. self-control. Well, it's like, like, I guess I'm people, saying, like, there's, there's other descriptors here beyond love. Let's yeah. talk about the other ones. Yeah, like yeah. Like, patience. Like, mm-hmm. uh, there, there doesn't seem to be uh, these... Attri- you know, attributing factors or, or characteristics on display in... Uh, penal substitutionary atonement and at least I don't see it and and I would actually say like I even the good shepherd uh, motif or whatever has been sort of ruined in the sense of I, I don't know if you've ever sure. heard this said but like 
Well, you know, a good shepherd will sometimes break the leg of his sheep to keep it from straying. <laughs> and so, I mean, I've heard that so many times. Like, I don't Bible even know if stuff. I've heard that. I probably oh, have yeah, at some like, point, but yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, so it's like, you know, like, a, you know, a really good shepherd might just like, like break the leg of its sheep so it can't wander if it's been wandering and then it'll learn not to wander. Dude, I'll tell you right now, I, I really doubt that's a real thing. Like, it's not. I, I doubt I that's friends. a real agricultural no, I thing some, because no, I grew I up some, on a sheep farm yeah. and I'll tell you right now, you're not breaking a sheep's leg. Like No, it's like it's like <laughs> your sheep is like your livelihood. Like it's uh, a yeah. like it's profitable. Well there's it's not profitable to have a sheep with a broken leg. And that's uh, uh You're also gonna friends. have to carry that thing around everywhere. Yeah. So I had some friends in they were uh, touring in Israel and they had a day where they were getting led around by a shepherd and they actually oh, like wow. said this to him like, is this true? Is this true? He's like, absolutely not. I would <laughs> never do that. And he was a shepherd of shepherd people. Like he was like, I would never do that. Yeah. And the other thing is, is like the idea that sheep just wander off. Like that's what they do all the time. That's also like erroneous. They don't. They're herd minded people. They stay with the herd. So the herd minded one, sheep. Yeah. Not people, but yeah. Sorry, sorry. Well, but bad. sheep and people are the yeah, are the are the inner the sheep. Yeah. Because we're caught. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I would say like like sheep uh, the idea that they wander, I mean, it is something to where sheep are so freaking stupid, man. Like I, I yeah. growing up on a sheep farm, you would just sit here and be like, What the heck, man, are you doing? Like all the time with sheep. Certainly they're herd minded, but I could see them wandering off. I can't see a shepherd ever breaking a sheep's leg, but I do, I think for the sake of analogy there, what they're obviously trying to do is say, there's a reason for God's wrath. There's, yeah. there, there's a, there's a reason for God acting violently that makes sense, but you just can't see it. And the same thing where it's like, people say, well, God is just as good and as kind and as merciful and loving as he appears to be in Jesus. But they're like, oh, but the one time... He made a whip, and he went into the temple, and they oh, won't man. say, you know, that was an act of prophetic drama in the tradition of Jeremiah, and yep. it was about cleansing the exploitation of immigrants out of the temple. No, 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 don't use the I word. It's not about that. Yeah. It's just proof that God can still be violent, because for some reason, it's more important for us to believe that God can still be violent than that God can forgive anyone. The Yeah, the echoes of violence are what we cling to in that story because mm-hmm. Jesus had a whip, so he must have hit people with it. Yeah. Yet the text does not tell us that he hit people with it. It tells us that he drove the animals out. Yeah. And it's actually quite popular and likely when you look into that story and you look into what's happening there, that it was the sound of the whip mm-hmm. that would have caused a type of chaos within the temple. Um I mean, even looking into that story, just because we are going to talk probably a little bit about violence and nonviolence, yeah. like that's honestly one of the biggest stories that people tell me right away. Okay, so God became nonviolent once He sent Jesus, which became I don't think is the 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 deal there. I think Unveiled God is fully revealed, see, yeah. and we can now see Him for for what He is and has been always. But anyway, uh, you look at that story, and what's happening there is. In Jerusalem would swell in size over Passover. So mm-hmm. all the Jews from everywhere, the surrounding areas would come in for Passover and even other people would come in for Passover just because it was an opportunity to make some money. Like, you know what I mean? You have mm-hmm. these, you know, tons and tons of people come into the city. So you have the city that's a typical population, grows mm-hmm. largely, and everyone would prepare for it and everyone would have to make sacrifices. So if you're going to make a sacrifice, you have to buy an animal to make a sacrifice. And... What would, in essence, happen is uh, capitalism was happening. <laughs> yeah, the price of, all of a sudden, the price of turtle doves goes way up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, two turtle doves. It's yeah, quite a bit now. Yeah, it's quite a bit. And also, you got to pay the other guy to switch your currency over. Yep. So they're going to take some. So, mm-hmm. you know, your like 10 cent turtle dove ends up costing you, you know, $10 because by the time that you've done the exchange rate and by the time that you've adjusted for like this sort of seasonal inflation, Yes. You're just getting shafted and all you wanted to do was get close to God in the way that you know how to do. And not only could the you The only not, way you've been told to do. Yeah. And not only that, but then there are people in place keeping you from being as close as you were legally allowed to be. Yeah. And so so imagine Jesus walks into the temple, sees people who are literally uh, dirt poor. Mm-hmm. being exploited for their last penny 
as their only way of being reconciled to God. I think he's right to be angry. I, yeah. In a similar way that you might say the prosperity gospel makes me kind of angry. Ooh. The I, idea yeah. that the idea that uh, just give God money like it, he'll bless you like and like oh. and you're just not being faithful or you, you just don't have enough faith or you, you know whatever fill in the blank with that whole yeah. thing, right? But I guess I'm saying like the idea that Jesus then responds in that anger to drive the animals out is to say, uh, and, and I mean, I'm not going to make my house, uh, the, the house of God, a den of thieves. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, like yeah, it, yeah. It, the, the, he, he kind of goes on a rant there about yeah. the, them being a den of thieves. And it's supposed this, to be a house of prayer for yeah, all nations. Exactly. This cause and, and all nations being a reference to the fact that people are coming from all over. Mm-hmm. You're making them have to change currency, all these other things. You're making, mm-hmm. you're making this process far more difficult and you're profiting off people's reconciliation to God, which is quite, you know, uh, yeah, quite heretical. Uh, even even in Jewish understanding, that would have been known to be. You, you know, the Pharisees were getting kickback on some of that money, right? Yeah, like a you, racket. You, there was a racket going on, exactly. And so Jesus goes in and and sends all the animals scattering and running, and in essence creates chaos. Mm -hmm. These animals go scattering and running, and and he's kind of like, I'm just going to destroy this whole system you guys guys set up. And I would actually say that moment is one of the key moments that leads him to the cross, too. Because I think the disruption he causes in the temple really communicates to the Pharisees, this guy guy is not going to go quietly... You know what I mean? Like this guy's not going to be a guy that we can tame. Yeah. That we can kind of, uh, uh, you know, a radical rabbi. He's a revolutionary, and, and he's going to cause yeah. us a lot of problems. We've just got to convince. Yeah. We just got to convince Rome to do it for us. Is yeah. Really, we got to convince were, what, them to do it for and, us. We got to convince them that they need it. And it's so funny because, like, Jesus even cooperates with that. You know, it's like, um, in I think it's Luke twenty-two. When he tells his disciples, you know, you guys went out before, you didn't have an extra coat to wear, you didn't have any mm-hmm. cash on you, you didn't bring food with you. Well, this time, be prepared. And also, you know, basically, some of y'all need to maybe sell a coat so you can get a sword, which could have been, I mean, that that word sword there is used pretty generously. So when I think of sword... I think of, you know, like King Arthur, big sword, something like that. It's but more it, likely a dagger. Yeah, yeah, a glorified kitchen knife kind of situation. But then the passage interprets itself for us and says, and this was done so that it could be fulfilled that said he was numbered amongst transgressors. So it's almost like saying, like, if... It's almost like uh, if I was hanging out with somebody that was wearing, like, Crips colors or something like that, mm-hmm. and it was like... Yeah, well, he was he was involved in gangs, so you know that's why we shot him. Yeah. You know what I mean? He was involved in gangs. It was like, well, no, no, no. Somebody with me looked like they might be involved in this, and the reason is because he had to be executed by the state. Well, and I think so. The, what's interesting is that passage interprets itself for us, like you said. Mm-hmm. It, it goes on to say, there's this prophetic passage in the Old Testament. And Jesus is constantly pointing to himself already revealed in the Old Testament, like, or at least much of Jesus' life and ministry, we're seeing echoes of what the prophets said about mm-hmm. the coming king, right? And Jesus is referencing himself as the coming king. Mm-hmm. Jesus is referencing himself as going to be one amongst the transgressors. So it's important to know at this time, there's all these people that, you know, Reza Aslan does a great job um, in his book, Zealot, um, talking about uh, what he calls dagger men mm. that were um, people who would go through the crowds when it would be very populated in, in Jerusalem, especially over Passover. So this was largely popular over the Passover season um, that were uh, zealots and they would have small little daggers and they would go up to Roman guards in a, in a crowd and in essence kill them really quick with a dagger mm-hmm. in, in the side and the stomach multiple times and then, like, scurry off. And when we see Barabbas later in the story, it's very likely he's one of these dagger men who mm-hmm. got found, who was found guilty of killing a Roman soldier, like mm-hmm. guilty of, of treason, uh, you know, against Rome uh, mm-hmm. for, for, for killing a soldier. 
Jesus seems to say there's this passage in the Old Testament that says the Messiah will be seen as one of these dagger men. And Mm -hmm. yeah, so go buy, you know, dagger. The interesting thing is then they actually do. Well, they they said, oh, we've got two right here. Yeah. And he's like, that's plenty. That's plenty. That's all we need. That's all we need. That's all we need. So (laughs) so anybody who says he's trying to, 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 well, there's a few things. Some people say, see, Jesus said I can own a gun. And I'm not going to say you can't own a gun. That's not what this is about. But what I guess I'm trying to say is if you're using that verse to say you should own a gun for self-defense, Jesus is clearly not worried about self-defense if he's only getting two swords. Yeah. He's not even arming all of his disciples. Totally. You need to arm everybody if you're worried about self-defense, especially if you're going up against literally the world superpower of Rome. Like, yeah. uh, self-defense, good luck. Like, that, that's, that's the first thing. Secondly, the, he's in the garden, and one of the swords gets used. Yeah. And Jesus says, what am I doing? Leading a rebellion? Yeah. Haven't you been with me since day one, pretty much? Like, this isn't what I'm about. Yeah. How, and would, then, you, how would you not know that this isn't my response? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, so, and then he tells him to put the sword away, and he disarms Peter. And I think in disarming Peter, he disarms us, but that's for a whole different conversation. I, I, but I guess, I guess when we talk about the, the violent echoes that, that, that can be connected to Jesus, I think they're all reaches. It's just, it's so interesting. And I, I say interesting because I've been saying the word heartbreaking a lot yeah. recently, but like, it is fascinating that like we, we're so willing to cherry pick and reach in order to protect our need for violence, our need to be able to say, like, no matter what, you can't take away my right to justify violence. I have to be able to kill to protect my family, or yeah. I have to be able to kill to protect myself, or I have to be able to kill to protect my country, or I have to be able, but it's like you, like... But that's you, connected to godliness, you, though. Yeah, that's the weird you, thing. Like, it's one thing to say it and say, okay... That's, I'm holding this as something that actually contradicts with my faith, right? Yeah. But it's actually one thing to lay it over your faith or to say my faith actually supports this. Or That's to, where we're Yeah, to cherry pick so that your faith can now sanctify it. Exactly. And that, that is, well, can we just be f- at least fair and just say that, okay, when I take a verse, like, for you, like you were saying, Hebrews 1, 3 or something like that, or if I take a verse like like Jesus saying on the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And I say for me that that disarms me and that that means that like God is really just like he's revealed to be in Christ. You're like, if you're going to cherry pick and reach, just let me cherry pick and reach too. And we'll just see. Exactly. And I don't think that I am, but it's just really rough because you get accused of that. People are so afraid that, like, if you're focusing too much on certain passages that just make God sound absolutely lovely and wonderful and merciful, that you're missing everything else. Even though when you're tr- when they're trying to defend, let's say violence, they're gonna have to do the same thing. Well, I mean, what what did Martin Luther King Jr. call um, our country the, the largest purveyor of violence? I mean, or something like that in the world. It's like, it was like there's, a, yeah. there's a there's there's a reality though that like our social construct is in conflict with the idea of a gospel that argues for peace and nonviolence. Well, like, because like that, we uh, need it. We we're so, prote- I mean like, well, well it, it would, I guess what I would say is it would fundamentally change our worldview yeah. to such a place that like for some people would be crippling. And so I, I understand that it's a process to even yeah. get there and, and, and whether or not you even get there in your lifetime. And I think you can totally follow Jesus and have all kinds of questions about peace yeah, I just sure. don't think I don't I don't I don't know that it, it would be uh, the most accurate way of understanding these multitude of passages. Right. I'll say the one problem that you have, and I don't know if you've wrestled with this one, mm-hmm. um, in God's violence being kind of stopped at Jesus is mm-hmm. the Ananias and Sapphira story. Oh, what do you think about that one? one? Yeah, um, I think, and I'll give like a really quick patent answer. And well, why don't you give an overview of the story for people okay. who maybe don't yeah, know? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's this time in the early church where um, everybody is basically giving, they're selling their land so that they can sponsor the community of the church because the church is basically these like swelling house churches 
And so they need places to stay and they need food and they're trying to, and, and then they're trying to provide for the poor in their mm-hmm. city and for widows in their city. So that takes a lot of resources. And the way that people are getting that resource is by selling their land and then laying it at the apostles' feet and trusting that they're going to redistribute it equitably. Mm-hmm. And the apostles are starting to appoint people to be in charge of that task um, because the goal is we want to take care of Jews and non-Jews equally and yeah, obviously, it's going to take financial responsibility. Mm-hmm. And then there's a man and his wife, Ananias and Sapphira, and they have some land, and they want to have the appearance of being all in for God, all out for God, or whatever. Mm-hmm. But they also have some concern for themselves because, quite frankly, all of this is happening really quickly, and do you really want to empty your bank account? Yeah. And just trust that what's happening is legit and that it's not going to fall through in, you know, a year. Yeah. And that you're not going to starve. So they sell their land, but they withhold some of it for themselves. But then when they lay it at Peter, so he's like the head of the church at the time, they lay it at Peter's feet and they say, this is it. And he asks them, he's like, was this everything? And like... I don't even know why that's his business, but he, but he probably knows. Like he's like yeah. he's like we did an appraisal on your property. And, yeah, uh, like, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This is not the full amount. And Hold he, on, he, you really got you really gave him a deal. If this is the full amount, yeah. <laughs> how good of you! And did you just get your hair done? Yeah, yeah. Oh, like your wow. nails look great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, it's it's really like the the question is like, did you? Is this everything? They lie. Yeah. And then Peter says, uh, how has Satan so filled your heart that you could believe that you could lie to God? And he mm-hmm. basically says, like, well, to the second, to, so at first it's Ananias, right? And he just, and he just drops dead. Drops dead. Right. And then Sapphira comes in looking for him, mm-hmm. doesn't know what's going on. And she basically tells the exact same story to Peter and Peter says the exact same thing to her. How has Satan so filled your heart to try to lie to the Holy Spirit? Mm-hmm. And then, and look, here are the feet of the men that carried your husband out, and they're going to carry you out too. And she drops dead. Mm-hmm. And then, and I think this is so interesting because for the first couple of chapters of the book of Acts, all this great stuff's happening, and the conclusion of these chapters tends to be something along the lines of, and many were added to their number that day. Yep. Thousands were added to their number that day. All this stuff. And then this happens and says, and not many were added to their number. And great fear fell over everybody. Yeah. And um, I know we've talked about this in the past. I look at it more as um, God did not enable their greed. And so he withdrew his hand of protection from them sure. and allowed, if you want to say, if, if you believe that Satan is, or, or, or the demonic forces or whatever the heck, principalities mm-hmm. and powers, there is some evil in this world that is beyond just what we've generated as human beings that has a, some sort of a life of its own. And its will is to steal, kill, and destroy, sure. I would say. So if you believe that, and for God to lift his hand and to allow them to be killed, basically, by something mm-hmm. that would have willed them to die to begin mm-hmm. with, it could have been him withdrawing for the sake of, okay, well, yes, like your physical body might be destroyed, but your soul is protected from this greed. Mm-hmm. And the rest of the church is sort of preserved because there's this level of severity that's seen, that's understood, Mm -hmm. um, so that this isn't being taken, so that greed doesn't take over the church in that sense. There's also the possibility that it was um, a freak occurrence (laughs) and that legitimately, that like... We got to argue scientifically, though. The idea that two people die back to back like that, like that's a pretty, yeah, eh, it's a pretty freak occurrence. And it's also not, and it's also not written about like 
And wasn't it crazy that that happened? Like, yeah. geez, guys, what the heck? Like, I don't well, know. Well, and it's attributed to God <clears throat> because right. anybody in the ancient world would have attributed any kind of death to God, especially totally. death that was preceded by lying to God. Like, like right. does that make sense? And even, and even Paul then later sort of attributes... Um, sickness and disease amongst people to like the way that they're abusing the Lord's Supper. And mm. I would say, okay, so do you think that God's killing them or making them sick? And I'll say, absolutely not. But do I think that he would withdraw some kind of protection from them so as not to enable them? Yeah. Because what he cares about more than just the well being of a person's physical body is like in essence, their soul. And that's to say the bodies are bad, Hmm. but it's just that like, would he, would God choose to not enable somebody to pass that on? Yeah. Would he allow there to be an understanding of some sort of severity in order to change the conversation in the future? And in that sense, uh, Satan is the sifter and the one who actually, like, it's, it's just like when Paul says uh, in, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6 or whatever, you know, turn this brother over to mm. Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that he'll come back. And you're like, well, wait a second. So then Satan's sort of on God's side in this because he's actually doing something positive. And it's kind of the same thing there. I, I don't, I do wrestle with it. That's one of the I don't hardest think, passages, yeah, I, think, I don't because think, even the silver bullet, I guess what I would say yeah. is there's not a silver bullet. And the, the, so the things I've heard to explain it, and I would even say like people try to explain it that are not nonviolent, mm-hmm. you know, not people that are compelled toward nonviolence. But I think, you know, I've heard, well, Ananias and Sapphira, it was actually God's grace because they were headed down a road of greed and God took them for that purpose. I'm like, ah, I don't know about that. Like, yeah. uh, yeah, yeah. okay. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Sure. But I, I don't know that that's the best argument. Yeah. Uh, probably I hope the, God keeps that kind of grace to himself. Yeah, I know. Me, right? you know? <laughs> Am I right? Like, Am I yeah. right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> the other I heard, which is probably, <clears throat> I would say, I think there's, there's a certain level of validity to this argument is that the community and the structure of the early church is so new at the time of Ananias and Sapphira making this decision that there has to be a level of purity that exists for it to continue. Mm -hmm. And that God releasing his hand of protection or however you want to, Mm -hmm. to determine what God is doing or not doing in that scenario. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, or willing and not willing. However, you know, you want to go into the sovereignty conversation there but anyway Mm -hmm. whatever God's allowing to happen or doing himself is done largely because the purity of the early church was a necessity for its continuance and its Mm -hmm. and its ability to move forward and this image of two people pretending to be sold out Mm-hmm. was an image that was not going to be possible for others to latch on to if the church was going to be successful mm. in the early going. And I mean, when you really unpack that and you think about, these are people who go to lions in just a few hundred years after this. These are people who who um, have to navigate Nero as emperor. Yeah, so these you, are these you are people really can't afford to have people. You, you that can't are just... afford to have people who are halfway there, like and and so I can totally see where it's like you're either in or out, like one or the other. There, in essence, you're hot or you're cold. You're not lukewarm, like you know what I mean. And like that that i that idea seems to be what we're dealing with with Ananias and Sapphira. Like they they like the idea of being Christian, but they don't seem to want to be all in. And the other thing is. No one asked them to sell their house. Yeah. No one was like, to be all in, you need to sell your house. Yeah. Because there were people that weren't selling their house in the early... Or maybe, I don't know that I would say there were people that weren't. No, the text that. seems to infer that there were people that weren't. Yeah. Um, totally. and, and, that, and that these were voluntary um, moments where the church was 
was volunteering to sell their house. Right. People in the church were volunteering to sell their house and not to appear more committed, but they were showing their commitment in that way. So and think of conviction and you think of saying, um, imagine that you have a house church yeah, and imagine that uh, a couple of people show up and... I've been in sort of these house church kind of prayer meeting mm-hmm. settings where like maybe it begins with sort of like prayer and like some testimonies, some things that the Lord's been doing. And let's say that somebody says, you know, um, I was so convicted that like I've been given all this property that I don't need and I want to leverage like its equity basically to help this. Like I felt like the Holy Spirit told me to do this and so I'm giving this to you guys and do with it as you will like just make sure that it's kingdom stuff you know what I mean sure and then let's imagine seeing those people and envying them and saying like well why is God speaking to them in a way he's not speaking to me Mm. are they better than me Everybody loves them now, mm. and you get this jealousy. These are still human beings. Greed. Yeah, totally. These are still human beings in the early church. They're not superhumans. Yeah, like, so like, all of that comes in. Yeah. And then finally, you're like, all right, so we are going to sell our house, but we're actually just going to downsize. And then we're going to like say that we did. Yeah. You know, and then we're going to. And we're like, going to sell our house with a lot of resentment in our heart for having to sell our house. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Potentially, yeah. right? Like, all there's of this, all these things. Yeah. So it's not, it's not just a simple case of like, well, I'm kind of afraid to not have money. Yeah. Because like, come on, I'm afraid to not have money too. Like, I get that. But it, it's more than that. It would seem Probably. to be more than it that. It would seem yeah. to be, yeah, exactly. We don't know that. It's and, all conjecture. And but, even what I'm saying yeah. as, 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 as a way of explaining it, like... Mm-hmm. I'm not 100% so, or I don't feel like that's a silver bullet that gets God off the hook. But I would say, no. here, here, here's the deal. Throughout the rest of the New Testament, I mean, Revelation is its own thing. Like, we're, we'll just put that aside. That's Jewish apocalyptic literature. That's, to me, a whole different category. But yeah, you don't see any advocating for violence in the rest of the New Testament. And if anything, you see the opposite. Mm-hmm. Advocating for, for, for nonviolence, not only yeah. in the life and ministry of Jesus, but in the simple fact that the, the, the largest missionary of the church is someone who used to be an advocate of violence and has now had a transformational experience and is no longer violent. Yeah. And that's a, the truth is, even if you cannot say, I really believe that God is nonviolent ultimately, mm-hmm. even if you cannot say that, I think you can say, you can come to the conclusion that if there is any kind of just violence, it is not, it is not carried out by humans. It's like if, if that's any, only God's. Yeah. If anybody's going to take life and it's going to be considered just, it would have to be the Lord because I'm not God. And yeah. when I kill somebody, I'm saying that I am, you know what I mean? And that, yeah, I mean, I think that's probably to me, the middle ground where you say, I, I'm not able to excuse the idea that there are maybe some acts of violence that God either was, was like really, really um, related to, you mm-hmm. know, if he didn't directly cause, but also saying that like, I cannot follow the example of Jesus as a violent person. And sure. that's kind of like that middle ground. Um, and I would be delighted if more people said, oh, you know what? I think that's okay, fine. I don't have to, yeah. you know. And I think when we have a view of God as angry, it tends to make us angry people. Yes. When we have a view of God as violent, it tends to make us violent people. When we have a view of God as not merciful, but Mm -hmm. just in a getting even way, Mm -hmm. we tend to be people who get even. When we have a view of God that is shaped by the fruits of the Spirit, again, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, when we see that in God, um, and we begin to allow that to shape our view of God, it typically shapes our view of ourself, or at least the self that we would desire to become, and therefore frames our relationships, it becomes the foundation of the type of people we're striving to, you know, that 
the idea of like tomorrow I want to grow in these traits mm-hmm. more than I have today. Like it begins to shape our character. Yeah. And therefore our actions. And starting to say, well, wait, if I know nothing but Christ and Christ crucified, mm-hmm. if that's really it, like it begins and ends with Christ crucified, what that reveals to us about who God is, who which God's was, always been. Yeah, which was said by someone who used to be a terrorist of the church. Yeah. Does that make sense? And, yeah. And, and who's now saying uh, all these things that I know, because I'm literally... The crazy thing about Paul is Paul's literally necessary for the church because they don't have a scholar. Mm -hmm. Like they don't have someone who really knows how to connect the Jewish faith to Christianity. Right. Because Jesus finds a bunch of fishermen to follow him pretty much. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And they're now handed the church and some of them have more education than others. But for the most part, they're certainly not anybody who would study under someone like Gamaliel. Like, you know what I mean? They're not, they're not a rabbi of rabbis. Like they, they don't have that, lineage in that educational history they didn't the way of thinking of it is like Saul who later becomes Paul graduated from Yale like you know what I mean or like yeah, or yeah, like yeah. Harvard or like you know he, he's an elite mm-hmm. and and he's zealous in his eliteness too like he's like he knows he's better than everybody else and he knows he he's the gatekeeper for the Jewish faith and when he comes over <laughs> to Christianity when he has this transformational mm-hmm. experience he almost becomes like an advocate against the Jewish faith, which is very interesting. Like not against, against might be strong, but like he's the one saying people don't need to be circumcised. Yeah. Like the, the, the way in which others are applying the connection, he's actually saying, no, 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 we don't have to apply the connection that way. Mm-hmm. And I would say what's interesting is this is someone who had every... If there's any character that could apply violence to the gospel, it Mm. should have been Saul. Yeah. Violence shaped his world. It shaped the way he knew God. It shaped the way he he understood his own faith. It shaped the way probably he was even brought up. I mean, if you think about it, like... Yeah. um, Yet, he nowhere advocates for it. And if anything advocates against it, I mean, like multiple passages you could go to where he, he advocates against it. Um, do not repay anyone evil for evil. <clears throat> like, yeah. you know, like there, 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 there's multiple spots that you could go to. And just his life story in general is a picture of the early church should have advocated violence against a terrorist who's trying to lock him up and kill him. Like, you know what I mean? Stephen stoned and Saul's there giving approval for the stoning in essence mm-hmm. participating. So he's yeah. partly responsible for the death of Stephen. And, and if anything, the early church should have locked themselves in their houses and carried daggers you know what I mean like you could make that argument uh, uh, but yet um, they don't they have a different approach they have a very Jesus like approach and um, man the fascinating part of that story Saul to Paul story is Mm -hmm. is and I keep saying Saul to Paul but I just mean like Saul's transition into into Christianity is when he's when he's blind you know and Ananias is sent to a different Ananias than the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ananias. <laughs> That's yeah, a popular yeah. name at the time. Um, yeah, but yeah. Uh, but but he's sent to uh, he's he's sent to bless Saul, and he's kind of like, did our, did our wires get crossed? Because Saul's this guy who's actually come here to like persecute us and and potentially like jail us or kill us, and yeah. And, and then he goes anyway after yeah. you know after kind of. Uh, being reassured that this is God's plan. And when he walks in the room, the first thing we're told that he said is brother Saul. Yeah. Which is fascinating because you're like, he sees him as a brother already prior to any evidence that he's a brother. Come on. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's pretty interesting because, and, and now whether that's the author later writing that or whether that actually happened like that, I like to think that it happened like that because the early church seemed to believe in the, mirac- in, the, in the miraculous enough to say, God's on our side, but n- God's not on our side advocating we operate with violence. Because many people say God's on our side, and that's why we'll win this war. Yep. But they seem to have a view of God's on our side, and that's why mercy will triumph. Yeah, and that's why you can be my brother. And that's exactly. And th- yeah. That's why redemption is possible even for Saul. And you're like, whoa, that's yeah. heavy. That 
that reframes things. Yeah. I remember in an ethics class I was in in college, the professor asked what, what we would do if we were talking about lying or whatever. And, uh, and the professor asked what would happen if he ran into the room like a couple minutes late to class, kind of all disheveled, and then sprinted out the other side of the room. It was this big, huge lecture hall with like 300 kids. And, uh, and he asked what would happen if um, shortly after a guy, like a minute after, walked in with a gun and said, you know, where did our professor go? And, uh, and we had seen that he turned right when he went into the hallway. What would we tell the person with the gun? And like half, the class was split. Like, uh, I think most actually would send him the wrong way, down the left way of the hall. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we were just talking about, is it okay to say a white lie? And of course, you could get into all kinds of stuff with the whole white lie, the, the, the Rahab story, all kinds of other things. And we, I think we were dissecting that yeah. story. But anyway, one of the things I thought was fascinating that came out of that conversation, and I think the, our, my professor had actually said it. His, his name was uh, Dr. Gibson. I believe, I believe he said this. It might have also been a student. It just struck me that day. But uh, it was said, what does it say of us that we take matters into our own hands in this area to send someone the wrong direction? For many of us, we're more interested in control than we are in trust. And so what does it look like to pray and trust God in that moment? Yeah. Are you, we actually yeah. interceding and praying for safety mm -hmm. or for God to intervene in the heart of this particular individual who's clearly got something against Dr. Gibbs? <laughs> does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But like, but like for us, it almost seems illogical, even those who believe in the power of prayer, it's, it would seem illogical to bring prayer into that place. I would also say there's a certain level of, illogicalness to bringing prayer into that place like yeah there's 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 just street smarts and wisdom and and like yeah maybe don't be dumb like you know what i mean but at the same time i think there's something to be said for we're far quicker to answer our problems with violence or with moral shading than we are with saying i'm gonna pray yeah and then well then calling your enemy your brother Oh, yeah. And you think about, um, I, I love this probably because I'm such a fan of Brian Zond and he's always bringing this up. Mm -hmm. But, like, if the beginning of all of this, you know, sort of what we'll call the satanic principle is, like, taking your brother and calling them the enemy other. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And then this enemy is the one that you fear, and the enemy that you fear is the enemy that you eventually feel that you have to kill in order to keep yourself safe from. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's how you get necessary evil. And this is tribalism. Right, it's exactly. It's almost rooted in our DNA, you could yeah, argue, right? Yeah, totally. So to go against that, that's what we see reversed. We see that reversed in yeah. Ananias where he says, I'm going to take my known enemy and I'm going to call him my brother because I've got faith that that's what God's making him. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to call things that are not as though they are. Mm-hmm. God have mercy on my soul. You know what I mean? We'll see. Yeah. We'll see what and, happens. And I mean, I think it's important to say Ananias was in hiding and he had a revelation yeah, that, totally, that this was, he totally. didn't just go walk up to someone who wanted to kill him and say, Hey, you're my brother. Like, like it's that, not like that, a snake handling situation. Yeah. It's not like a snake handling situation. Exactly. <laughs> Which but is I, so crazy. Yeah. But I do think there's, there's power in believing that, that the redemption of our enemies is possible, mm -hmm. but then there's also power in actually praying for it. Yeah. And even if praying for it never changes your enemy's heart, it's going to change yours. And, and to riddle me this, like, who am I becoming more like when, when my heart changes so that I want my enemies to be saved? Yeah. Like, am I becoming less like Christ when I do that? Or am I becoming more like the one who says, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Definitely. And it's okay because even if even if this side of eternity, I don't see that person released from the things that they're doing or, or causing or whatever that I think are evil or wrong, I can be released mm. from my judgment of them. Mm. I can be released from that satanic thing that calls them the enemy other that has to be feared, yeah. that has to be killed. There's no love in that fear. Right, exactly. 
and 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 again, love of your neighbor, mm-hmm. I would say, is it, included in that is enemy. Like, mm-hmm. and if you even don't include that, which is the second greatest command to include mm-hmm. your enemy, let's say you don't. Let's say you found some way to judo move out of that. Jesus yeah. makes it very clear to love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Yeah, and I would say we don't. In a lot of like, well, let me say it this way: the church certainly is not creating common practices for us to love our enemies. I I I can't remember once being told to pray for those who persecute me post 9-11 Osama bin Laden. I can't remember ever having the church tell me to pray for Osama bin Laden or any spiritual leader in my life. Oh, it's so funny because when I was a kid, and I think this is just evidence that like some of Christianity, like God was doing something. Because I remember being a little kid after that and like the first couple nights, because I, I was in second grade when mm, 9-11 okay. happened. So, like, I was afraid that there were terrorists in my closet for the first couple of days. Of course. And yeah. I was just like, oh, I don't even know. And then I learned the names of people, like, and there was years where every night I would pray with my dad and we'd pray for Saddam Hussein and we'd pray for Osama. Really? Bin yeah, I did. And nobody, like, I didn't know that that was, like, a weird thing to do. It was like, I pray that my grandpa gets saved and I pray that Saddam Hussein gets saved. I pray that Osama bin Laden gets saved. Wow. And like, whatever. But then I also remember at the same time. That's amazing. Yeah, man. getting a little bit older and starting to learn about um, like North Korea and their just their kind of nuclear volatility. We'll just say sure. it that way. Yeah. And I remember having this sense in my heart like, can we just blow them all up and get it over with? Like, yeah. if it's going to come to this, can we just hit them before they hit us? Like, can yeah. we please, like, I, and I think as I got older, I learned to be more and more afraid of people like that. Sure. And as I got older, I learned that violence was the only way that we could control those outcomes. And then as I got older, I started to unlearn that, you know, mm. but it's, it's really, really crazy. Um, I have some friends in the military, they've said uh, about Iraq, like, we either just need to blow it up or get out of there because, like, there's no, we can't just, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I mean, I I talked to, when I was in United Arab Emirates, just, um, uh, it's coming up on a couple years ago, I got a chance to talk to a doctor who lived in Iraq, had two Mm. houses in Iraq, was a doctor in Iraq, a teacher, a professor, and she's like... Iraq under Saddam Hussein was, you know, Saddam Hussein wasn't that great of a dude, but at the same time, like, I, I, and she's a Christian. Mm-hmm. I was able to be a Christian in Iraq, and, like, things were, there was problems. Things were problematic, right? But it wasn't nearly as bad as it is now. She doesn't even have either of her homes anymore because, obviously, ISIS comes through, and she can't even go to Iraq. Like, there's just... And, and and obviously she doesn't, I mean, everybody has their own worldview based on where they are and what they've done. And so, like, I'm not, I don't want to be uh, critical of our government and our way of handling it. But certainly sure. there, was, there was some seemingly misinformation that led us into that particular region. And um, that misinformation has led to her having a very different view of our government, of our mm-hmm. desires, our, you know... Our ways of going about things, and, and you just sit here and you talk to this person on the other side of the globe who has a very different view of the world because their entire life has been turned upside down because of it. Like for her, yeah. she had to go to UAE to seek safety, but then her kids had to only got citizenship into other countries, and her husband got citizenship, and they're literally all over the globe, and they were all refugee status. Um, wow, and. And so you just look at that and you're like, dang, man, this, I don't think we understand the kind of turmoil we, we, we cause when we enter into these conflicts. And but many of these but conflicts you'll enter are, into those lightly well, if you believe... If you believe that someone's out to get you. Yeah, it, it, and it, if you believe that, like, that's how God defeats evil is exactly. by being, like, like um, mm. it's a gunfight, but God's going to win because he's got the biggest guns. Dude. And that, like... 
when, then America starts to look like God to us. Like American military intervention starts to look like God because we think that God wins yeah. his fights by having the biggest guns. So, well, we're the next best thing. And we're also like the largest Christian nation in the planet, right? Maybe. Okay, cool. So then we're kind of like God in this. Uh-huh. And now it, it's a much smaller leap to believe that God would want us to go to other countries and to kill people and to destroy governments and things like that. Because we think that that's what God does anyway. Yeah. I, when you came to, to the nonviolent view, mm-hmm. did you come to it because of scripture? Like, I guess what I would say, or did you have like faith leaders bringing you to that? Like, yeah, you know what? what was, what was the, what was the genesis of that for you? Um, the genesis of that was for me was I was hesitant, but I wanted to believe that God looked just like Jesus, but I was just like, there's too much in the way. Mm. I don't know if I can see that, but if it's true, this is good news. If this is true. Yeah. I actually want to preach the gospel because it's the best thing I've ever heard. You know what I mean? But I don't know, and I don't want to do that lightly, and I don't want to start saying things if I'm not really, you know, I, I need to know what, what's in my hand before I play it, you know? And so uh, my mentor at the time was a Brethren in Christ worship leader who's also the head of the worship arts department at Lancaster Bible College. Okay. And... Uh, so, and he, just for people who don't know, yeah. Brethren in Christ is an Anab- in, in the Anabaptist yeah. tradition, Anabaptist meaning baptize again. Yeah. And back at the time of the Reformation, these were particular individuals who took a nonviolent position um, and have held right. that position s- since the Reformation in, right. in their approach to understanding Christ and understanding the gospel. And so right. j- just context for those people totally. who don't know what Brethren in Christ uh, believe. or right. you know, And by the way... I'm a brother in Christ pastor, yeah. so obviously. I'm and I, I work toward, at a brother in Christ yeah. church right now yeah. myself. So yeah, and I and I love it. But he, I didn't know how awesome this guy was. And I mean, because he's at LBC, so he's not, he's not closeted. He's just <laughs> kind of a, and I, I hope I don't get him in any kind of trouble, but he's just kind of... You haven't of, said his name, you're okay. Yeah, he's sort of an, an insurgent in the sense that, like, there's people in that department that are, like, uh, so, so, so incredibly Presbyterian and Reformed and whatever. And then there's also him. And as I was wrestling through things and talking to him and getting excited about the gospel, but also, like... Oh my goodness, atonement, blah, 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 blah. He, he kept being like, he, he was on that side and he would just kind of, it was almost like breadcrumbs. It felt like he would like, he would be with me where I was. He would challenge what I said a little bit. And then he would also just sort of sprinkle something else in front of me. And then I would get to it. And I'd like, like stuff about nonviolence, especially. I would say he really like kind of led me to a point, like just by, just by, um, like, he's the one who told me about Bruxy Cavey, um, or he's, he, yeah, I don't know. He's just challenged a lot of things for me. Um, so he started but in pointing a loving you toward, way. he started pointing you toward different... Um, examples of the peace position, people that... People who are holding the yeah, peace position and examples and, of it. And things, and just, um, and then when I would challenge, when I'd say, like, well, you know, Book of Revelation, like, eh, like, I don't know. I guess if violence is going to happen, it has to be God that does it. And he's just like, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't hold my breath for that. <laughs> like, just things like that. And I was like, huh. But, I mean, he's just one of the best people that I know. Like, yeah. he's just, like, honestly, such a pleasure to speak highly of him. So, like... And he it, probably didn't tell you, you got to believe this. He no, probably was, not like, giving all. you different resources to study and then being like, oh, well, that's one thing you could think from it. And you're like, that, well, what do you mean? What are the other things? Well, there could be other conclusions. I mean, totally. And like, and like that's, totally. I feel like that's a compelling place because it's like that's, it's actually really refreshing when you enter into those places where people aren't telling you what to believe, but they're like saying, well, here's what I'm compelled to believe. But like, I got here because of these sources and this is where I'm at. But, and then you come back and you're like, well, I don't believe it because of this. And they're like, okay. And you're like, hold on, okay. No, 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 this is where we argue, and we're no longer friends anymore. <laughs> like, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But it's like, like a space where we can actually have conversation, and, and educational institutions are supposed to be that space yeah. where you can wrestle with a variety of ideas, especially well, theological spaces. And this and was a safe person, too. Where it's that's like, the thing. Safety. I could tell you, yeah. like, 
Like, I could tell him, like, oh, this is the sermon that I was listening to, and blah, blah, blah. Or I could tell him, like, man, I've just been having the hardest time not, like, lusting or whatever. Yeah. Like, it would be, like, safe. You know sure. what I mean? And I think the really, if you are somebody that would say that I've, like, I would personally, like, I would say that I've deconstructed, deconstructed a lot of things, and a lot of things are being built into something that I'm compelled to say is more Christ-like. And it's the best thing to me. But if you're if you find yourself in that place, you can't you can't be that person and also not be the safest person in the room mm. to just be a human being around. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you cannot be um like seeker friendly or whatever, like friendly for people that have questions, mm-hmm. but then not be sinner friendly. You know what I mean? Yeah. People that are actually like struggling with the real things in life too. Yeah. Um, and that for, for me, just having some people in my life that are really represented mm-hmm. a pretty holistic picture of sort of what it looks like to like believe that God looks like Jesus. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's like the biggest thing. My journey to nonviolence was very different. Well, how did that happen for you? So I was questioning a lot of things. But I was also really starting to be exposed. Prior to that, I had been exposed to much of the racism I had grown up to believe. What year was this? mm, It would have been, uh, it would have started to unravel in college. Uh, So 2006, probably 2007, I was living in Boston. Mm -hmm. And um, I was living in a 97% uh, Dominican American, African American Mm -hmm. context where I was the minority in this community and I was interacting with this community regularly because I was doing community work for an organization called the Boston project. They're amazing. They're in Dorchester, uh, Dorchester, Boston. (laughs) And, uh, and, um, I loved it, man. I, I, I had actually had a pretty bad experience in ministry and, and I was doing just hands on loving people type work. And I had a lot of, I'll call it racism. Some others might call it just stereotypes, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, But I hadn't really ever been in an African-American community the way I was fully immersed into this community. Okay. And uh, began to be around people who were far more aware of systemic racism than I was and... um, or than I had even considered. Does that make sense? Like, I just, I wasn't even aware that this was a thing, would be the way of saying it. Like, so obviously, everyone loves Martin Luther King Jr. Does that make sense? We all love Martin Luther King Jr. We're all like, yay, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and at a certain point um, in that time, I really came to uh, start to actually read Martin Luther King Jr. Like letter from a Birmingham jail like that. Mm -hmm. That's something that should be required reading for everybody in our country. I think like that's a phenomenal letter um, laying out not only a really good um, nonviolent civil disobedience, you know, Mm -hmm. way of going about things, but also laying out the realities of racism that existed in Martin Luther King Jr.'s time What I thought was fascinating for me was, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. was a pastor. He was a reverend. Like, Mm -hmm. and beginning to see his, if anyone had a right to advocate for violence. Yeah. And this is where we see Malcolm X, right? Like, Mm -hmm. Malcolm X is on the other side of this. Like, we need to, we need to take up arms. We need to be violent. We need to respond with violence. Like, we need to answer this violence with more violence and in essence, we need to fight for our freedom, um, which is one response and a response I can understand based on what was happening at that time that, that, that someone would conclude. But Martin Luther King Jr. has a very different response. He's like, no, we're going to do this in a nonviolent way. We're literally going to like, we're literally going to have our bodies be uh, a testimony to the Mm -hmm. evil that's happening even yeah. as they kill us or hit us or jail us or do like we're, we're going to bear we're gonna, witness. Yeah, we're going to show the world. We're going to show the world is, how yeah. evil this is by putting our, our lives, our bodies on the line. Mm-hmm. And he got this from Gandhi 
mm-hmm. and also Tolstoy. And so I start studying Gandhi and Tolstoy. And by the way, I'm not even like, I, I'm, I'm aware that there's peaceful parts of the gospel, right? Yeah. But yeah. I'm really coming to this conclusion or coming to this like reality through Gandhi, Tolstoy, and Martin Luther King Jr. That's awesome. And like I got this poster we're both looking at right now, yeah, Martin Luther yeah. King Jr. in my office, which is darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And violence it's like cannot drive out violence. Yeah. yeah. It, it, you think of that, it's like how how true is that? Like, that's so true. Like, Mm -hmm. when we operate, and this is what we call it, right? Uh, It's the myth of redemptive violence. Mm -hmm. That violence can redeem anything. But back to atonement. If If you believe believe, God redeemed us through violence, it's a lot easier to believe my violence could lead to the redemption of something. And you got to ask yourself the question, and like, I would... Be suspicious that it's reveals something pretty ugly, but you got to ask yourself which one are they really fighting for? And when I say they, I just mean people that are very resistant to the idea of nonviolent atonement. Mm. Are they trying to protect their right to violence, or are they trying to protect the picture of God who can resort to violence? God, are they trying to protect God's rights to violence or their rights to violence? That's really the question, and and to me. I would be very suspicious that it has a lot more to do with our own right to violence, even though we see Jesus put his body in the line, like Martin Luther King was talking about, and shaming that sort of scapegoating, redemptive violence yeah. idea. Yeah. Because, you know, it was, uh, it was the Caiaphas, the high priest, right, who said, it's better for one man to die for the sins of all these people or for than for the nation to perish. And he's thinking about, uh, we can leverage executing Jesus to get in good with the Roman government so that they yep. don't destroy us because tensions were running hot. Super hot, yeah. So there, he's thinking, we can, we can use Jesus as a scapegoat and it'll keep us in their good graces. And it doesn't. It doesn't no. succeed. They end up, I mean, it's great in the sense that Herod and Pilate become homies, you yeah. know, allegedly. <laughs> but like, but, but, you know, they get along really well. That's after the they, Greek term, homies. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Says, totally. No. <laughs> <laughs> so like, they, like, I get that sense of it. But in general, like this whole idea of scapegoating yeah. does not work. And uh, what is it, 40 years later? Or 39 yeah. years later, something like that. The temple's destroyed. Jerusalem sacked, you mm-hmm. know. And that's a whole... Where the worm dieth not, right? Yeah, that's a whole thing there. Like the... <clears throat> yeah, I mean, when it comes to... I think there's multiple motivations when it comes to why people would be very resistant to a Christus Victor view of atonement. And by the way, we didn't even get into the other views. There's like ransom theory. There's yeah, all different that. kinds of other theories. I think ransom and Christus Victor are pretty compatible with yeah, each other. they are compatible with each other. Yeah. I think the incompatibleness is where penal substitutionary atonement is with most other views of atonement. Yeah, I would say. Like, it's actually, I think, the, probably the most exclusive. Yeah, because if you believe that, there's not a whole lot of room for other interpretations or... Mm-hmm. You could lay that. You could lay certain other interpretations over top of it, but you're only accepting bits and pieces of it. Like, right. like you know, and certainly not Christus Victor. Well, you could say Christ is victorious because God. Like, I don't know. You could probably yeah. throw stuff stuff yeah, in. Like, yeah. you, you could you could synthesize all of the different views of atonement, but you would only be taking a limited part. That was the first in, thing in that I them. tried to do. Yeah, was synthesize as many as I possibly could. And what I actually found out was that the penal substitutionary atonement theory is the only one that just really jacks up all the other things. And, and it jacks up the meta view, like you said, of, of who God is, oh, who yeah. I am. It's am, I allowed to, yeah. am I allowed to purvey violence? Is God allowed to you know, be a purveyor of violence? Like, are these things that that are okay? And if your atonement theory says this is actually how redemption happens, you're a lot more likely to um, to argue for violence and advocate in that direction. Right. I would say that's one reason. So, like the, the people's picture of God and people's picture of themselves and what they're allowed to do. Those are those are two reasons. I'd say I'd give two other ones. One. They've been taught that anything outside of that is heresy, and they're just afraid. 
Yeah, totally. They're afraid to let it go. They're not really attached to it. I'm afraid like, that I'm going to lose my faith I'm if afraid, I do this. I'm afraid if I do that, that is a slippery slope to liberalism or to heresy or to to atheism. Like, I mean, they could go... I mean, I've heard people talk about that. Like, they, I yeah. mean, far more than, than, than I would like to admit, like, that, that, that see penal substitutionary atonement as the linchpin that when you lose that... Uh, you are just now, you know, it's, a, a liberal theologian in every single sense of the way, which I think is yeah. fascinating to, 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 to make that the linchpin because you're also saying the people that, that deny that view of atonement are incompatible with the gospel or leaning toward being in, incompatible with the gospel when I would say they're actually more compatible with the nonviolent view of Jesus that yeah. we see in the gospel um, but then I would say the, the other one is that, um, so, so I said, obviously maybe you want to, to hold your view of, of your ability to enact violence. You want God, uh, to continue to look like a violent God, whether these are conscious or subconsciously happening, right. Or you're afraid to, to step outside or there's no fear really here, but it's just like. I've lived my most of my life with this view and it's just hard to change views. Like we're just stubborn. Like I, I sense some people are just stubborn. And I just want to be rewarded for believing what I've always believed. And I, I just want church to be a place where I hear the things I already believe exactly in a slightly different way or in a maybe slightly challenging way, or I would just want to be reinforced in what I already believe. Mm-hmm. It's actually a place that I go to feel like I'm like my beliefs belong with the greater whole, like it, it's it's a yeah it's a reinforcement thing like, um, and change is hard, and I would also yeah. say in the evangelical world, we don't put a priority on a on a faith that's on a theology. Let me say that not even just faith on a theology and understanding of God that is constantly in flux. Instead, we draw out a finish line, and here's what it looks like to be here's all the check boxes you have to check to fit and belong. Bounded set. And the moment you start to, yeah, well, <laughs> that's all another, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but the moment you start to uncheck boxes or question whether or not that box should be checked, ooh. You could get now, rejected. Yeah, you, get, you could get kicked out of that community real quick. Right. And so there's this necessity to say, okay, unless I'm 110% sure, I'm not unchecking any boxes. And the truth is, is like to journey somewhere, you have to be able to explore without being 110%. Like you, you yeah. have, like you had to explore this topic and you had a safe person around you. Totally. That, 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 that gave you freedom to explore, freedom to, to disagree, freedom to, to consider a new perspective and I just don't think many people have that in their faith communities. They don't have someone that's... I don't think I realized how blessed I was to have my youth pastor, who's also my mentor still today, oh, that's cool. until I started realizing how many people don't have someone in their life that that can speak a really hard word into their life. Because mm-hmm. like, he can do that to me, and he has multiple times. But also someone who can say, I don't know, what do you think? Hmm. Hold on, I'm coming to you to tell me what to think. What do you think? You're like, yeah, sorry. I'm... Yeah, and, and like when I realized how many people don't have that in their life and how many people, when they go to their mentors or leaders or, or people in their life, you know, that they just get a, well, this is what we believe. And then they just are like, okay, well, let me throw that block in there without ever examining it. And then the moment they actually are like, met with pushback they have all these blocks to examine Mm -hmm. and there's just too many and that's where i would say some people are on this issue is they're like i can't pull a block out and examine it because if i pull this block out i have to pull all the other blocks out time for all i don't have time for that i got kids now man or i got you know it could be a time issue it could also be another fear issue of the moment i pull that block out and examine it i gotta actually assess how many blocks i've shoved in here that i've never examined if that one's wrong yeah, totally. And the the point of the matter is, is that in a house of cards, they're all the linchpin. That's yes. the thing. So like, if all of a sudden you think that maybe you can affirm homosexuality or something, you know, yeah. God forbid, 
Yeah, you're right. That is the linchpin. Or if all of a sudden or you penal think substitution that, yeah, penal substitution be, or yeah. uh, egalitarianism or any of these things, environmentalism, whatever, yeah. nonviolence, they're all the linchpin because it's a house of cards. It's built so it's, – it's a systematic that like it is the sum of necessary parts. If that's how you were taught to hold your faith – you you are you are setting yourself up for a faith crisis. Absolutely, and it's okay. You know, it's a faith crisis. You get your temple destroyed, and you get shipped off to Iraq. Basically, you know what yeah. I mean. Like we talk about the exile. Yeah, we talk about the people of God having a faith crisis. And I remember asking one of my professors. He's a brilliant man, and I was beaming with pride and also deeply unsettled when I asked him why the Old Testament doesn't seem to give much of a rip about the afterlife and doesn't really talk about it. And if Mm. it does, it's never in binary terms. And he legitimately said to me, nobody's ever asked me that before. And I was just like, I feel amazingly intelligent for having asked that very obvious question, but also, oh crap. You know what I mean? No one's thinking about this. Like, why are we not? Why are we not talking about this? And I'm, I, lots of people actually are thinking about this. It's just in that circle, yeah. it wasn't being asked. And that's where it's like, if you you're talking about, if you don't think that your faith can be a journey, if you don't think that you can hold ideas in tension, if you don't think that things can be changing, you're gonna have a really hard time when you start to look at the history of the people of God and how much has changed. <sighs> oh man! And then you're like, that's oh. another bad. We don't do church history. Yeah, were you yeah, taught yeah, church yeah. history in church? No, no, of course Churches not. Churches don't teach church no, history. No, we're right, and we've always been right, and yeah. it's always been this way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And <laughs> the tribalism that exists within the church community leads us to often not want to do church history because we're the right tribe. Whether we have to we're protect the, our narrative. Yeah, whether we're the, you know... Uh, Southern Baptists or whether mm-hmm. we're the Presbyterians... Or the charismatics. Or the charismatics. We, we're we're the right we're the right ones. Like or or our version of history is the right version of history. Even though those versions of history, everything goes back to the Reformation. First of all, which most people don't even know. Right. Like, and, well, I know it, there's like almost a blindness where it's like everything before that was just monolithically evil. Yeah. Like, what? Well, How could yeah. that possibly be true? Yeah. And and <laughs> yeah. And and then that and and I would say it this way: I grew up with uh, uh, I was you know, I was basically taught Catholics aren't Christians. Oh yeah, me too. Up, of course, like hundred um, percent. And that's I would say a predominant view in the evangelical church: mm-hmm. Catholics aren't Christians, um, which is fascinating now. Or most um, of them aren't. Or, or most of them aren't. Yeah. Or some some way of of shading that right. And mm-hmm. like, and then to to study church history and be like, okay, hold on, what? Like, the Catholic Church was the only church. <laughs> up until the time of the Reformation? Oh, yeah. whoa. Well, because oh, we didn't think that Eastern no Orthodox one, people were Christians either. No one taught me this. Mm. Like, exact, Like no one told me, like, oh, so this idea is 500 years old. Like, huh? Like, like you know, like... And then to see also the reality that, like, even since the Reformation, the amount of change and 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 theological ideas that have been held in tension and, and, and you could even argue just have completely flipped to the other side. Mm-hmm. Like, totally. and, and that people hold now very fundamentally that would have been held in tension back then or things that were held in tension back then that people hold fundamentally now. And you're just like, don't tell me that there's not some, the big word is, and it's a word that scares a lot of people, especially fundamentalists, is nuance. But when you study church history, you see a lot of people approaching a lot of very complicated topics with a lot of nuance. Mm -hmm. And at the very least, you see over hundreds of years with many church leaders, it's a nuanced conversation about, you know, pick a particular theological topic that you have people on a variety of sides. Mm -hmm. So it's not, this is the only way of understanding it. There seems to be... and you, you study church history and you, you find that on a variety of topics and you're like, huh, well, that's interesting. No one told me that when they told me this is what I'm supposed to believe. Right. No that, one... was a, that was a Bible college thing for me. It was like the first theology course that I had, which was um, it was called Prelude to Biblical Theology. And you kind of learned what systematic theology was. But uh, 
Professor that's Dr. Kim is really a really great dude. Uh, I disagree with him on a lot of things now, but he's really, <laughs> really great. And one of the things that he successfully did, which I had other theology professors that 100% failed at doing, was he would, he would present multiple positions. That's awesome. And he would say, like, hey, this is a way, this is a way, this is a way. Of course, like... I'll be honest with you, I see it this way, but like, he didn't even, even say that for everything. There were a yeah. couple things he would speak up about because he was such a fan of Martin Luther, but like, you know, there just, there's, there's an idea of like, hey guys, there's dogma, things that like, we really have to believe, and otherwise, you can't really call yourself an Orthodox Christian. Sure. Um, but then there's things that are doctrine, mm-hmm. which are important to certain denominations, and then there's opinions and conjecture and all of that is outside of this. And yeah, yeah. And, and realizing that there's like tier one, tier two, tier three kind of issues. And so we had that idea, but then almost, I would say 95% of the rest of my college experience was people treating you like everything was dogma. Yeah. If you're smart enough, everything's well, dogma. If you're smart enough or if you've been trained in the idea of fundamentalism. I would also say systematic theology is the way you were trained and the way I was trained. Mm-hmm. And I found that to be super unhelpful. I think we're, 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 we're coming up upon, I guess, the precipice of a new way of understanding theology, at least a new modern approach to theology. It's probably going to be a resurrection of an old way that we probably... Yeah, you know, use, the idea used of to form theology. Yeah, or, like or, or well, potentially that. I, I think uh, I would call it like a flexible theology, and, and 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 I don't mean flexible in that like okay, let's wiggle our way out of these difficult topics. I more mean flexible theology in that systematic theology, and maybe even mystic theology. It might be called that's going to scare some people, but I guess I would say like. What systematic theology is trying to do is fit God into an equation. A plus B equals C. I'm like, yeah, so, if we look at all these parts, we can if make we look sure at all that these they do verses, fit together. Yep. If we look at all these scripture verses, um, and this is, it, it's promoting cherry picking because it's typically saying over here it says this, and over here it says this, and over here it says this, so God must be this. Or this topic, God must believe this about this topic. And while that's super helpful for a um, community going through the age of reason and beginning to factor everything into categories that are fact or not fact, Mm -hmm. because that's what we do, right? Um, That process was was a valid approach to what the questions that society was asking at the time. And so we created an approach. Then we systematized it, systematized systematic theology, and we taught it to students that way. And you have these big, it, sure. yeah, you have these big books that I probably have on my shelf. Back. Yeah, oh, yeah, I've got some of them on my shelf back here. Systematic theology. What? Do you God have bless. Grudem? Yeah, Wayne Grudem. You have Wayne Grudem. Grudem and, That's right. Uh, uh, and, oh, who's the other guys. one? What's the other uh, one I had? Uh, I forget. I think Norman Geisler does okay. some. Okay, Norman Geisler. Like apologetics. But everyone has the Grudem book, yeah. man. Everyone yeah. does that. Like, if you went to college, you have the Grudem book. And hey, Wayne Grudem, man. Geez, super intelligent. Yeah, uh, totally. like there's. It's not that that's wrong. It's that that was one approach. The struggle is that approach doesn't leave a whole lot of room for nuance. It also doesn't leave a whole lot of room for mystery. Because all mystery is sought to be put into an equation, and an equation can be solved. And if it can't be solved, we just don't have the right mathematicians working on it yet. And, and it, you can argue that systematic theology has an element of pride to it in that we are really trying to, to understand God, which I think is important, but understand God in ways in which maybe we should have the humility to admit we never will. That is, yeah, that's, that's really hard for me personally. Because um, right now I feel like I get a lot of it. Yeah. There's a lot that I don't get. Oh, but, there's so much I don't get. Yeah, but then. But I also think as I get older, I'm just like, wow. Yeah. I, but uh, there's also a pastoral element to this too. Mm-hmm. So, so, so layer over it the pastoral element that you're meeting with people who have complicated stories, 
complicated backgrounds. And now you're like, hold on. I was taught if this person believed this way or was this way, this was the way it was, this was their destiny. And but now I'm starting to see something different or I was taught the proper response to this should be this, but man, it just doesn't seem like that's the proper response to yeah. this. Like, What's more important mm-hmm. too? that question of like, like as a pastor, yeah. do you see yourself more as a provider of answers or more as a provider of comfort? Like being the person mm, that I don't like, see myself as a provider of answers, although I do answer things. Sure. I don't see myself as a provider of comfort, although I do com- do provide comfort. I don't know what I see. Uh, a provider of, oh man, what am I a provider of? That's interesting. Even thinking of myself as a provider is interesting. Well, it's like it did. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I would say if, if, if I would lean on anything that I, that, that I desire to be, not yeah, that I totally. always am, right? Because I think sure. that's important. I don't want to say sure. that. I, it would be more like a lover of people. Mm. Like, yeah. like, I want to be an example for what it looks like to love people, and I fail at that all the time. Like, but I would hope that I'm setting an example for what it looks like to love people in totally. the radical way in which Jesus loved people, yeah. even difficult people. And as a pastor, systematic theology can, can work to help that mm-hmm. and even lift that up. It can also work to really tear that down. And I would say, you know, you can look back 50 years ago in the church and see the way we treated people who got divorces. Mm. And that was a systematic theology approach to how we handle divorce. Yeah. And, and that's when I, I have not figured out yet how to deal with, um, like, there's just, I know I will sooner or later, I'll just start reading about it and I'll work <laughs> through that. Right now, I'm just okay with the fact that, like, if your divorce is not the end of the world, I'm pretty sure you can still do anything. Yeah, well, and so if you get divorced and remarried, you could argue that this is adultery, right? Um, it, it, the, the, there's a there's a biblical argument for that. Well, there's a systematic theological argument for that, and it was mm-hmm. the it was the theology of the day back in the early 1900s, even through the you could even argue through the 1990s. Like you could totally. even argue it's still on display today. I've in many seen examples of it. Yeah. So uh, the thing is, is like. You think about the amount of harm that's done, the amount of people that have been hurt by that, the amount of people that maybe even have walked away from their faith because of that. Yeah. Um, the way in which they were handled. And I would say no one thought to ask themselves, is this the loving thing? Is this the loving approach? Um, or maybe people did, but I guess I'm trying, I'm, not, I'm, I'm being a little bit hyperbolic. I want to say no one did. I'm saying like, Systematic theology seems to make it less about the person and more about the system, is what I would say. Mm-hmm. And if I want to be a lover of people, I can't be bound to a system that says, if X person does X, it equals you know Y or whatever. Like you right. know what I mean? Well, like and like what and you it's end up just doing is you just get cornered all the time. All the time. And things like I I remember um, this is one of the things I really wrestle with with the more charismatic side of things mm-hmm. is that if you don't allow there to be some kind of mystery. You turn the miracles and the power of God into a formula of faith equals action, Mm. right? So it's either you don't have enough faith or I don't have enough faith or one of us doesn't have enough faith because God always wants to heal. He wants to heal you right now, but we're stopping him even though we're asking him to do it. Uh, And oh, by the way, asking him to do it is not really having faith. It's only faith if if you have faith and you ask. And you have to have enough faith. And you might have faith uh, for headaches, but you don't have headaches for, or I mean, you don't have faith for broken limbs. And like, you, mm. you might have faith for broken limbs, but you don't have faith to raise the dead and blah, 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 blah. And you just, it, you get so cornered and it, it killed me. Yeah. Because then I finally got to a point where I felt like I did have faith and I prayed for my grandfather because he had just died, oh, like man. in front of me and God didn't do anything. And I was like, I need to not lose my faith. I need to not lose my faith. I need to not be angry. I need to not, mm. I need to, I need to move on. I need to just do the Christian thing. I should just be worshiping all the time now. I need to do all this stuff. And then you confront the reality of it. And they'll say, I mean, I've heard this by teachers in that, in that stream, you know, if your experience doesn't line up with the word of God, 
Are you going to try to bend the Word of God to your subjective experience? Or are you going to ask God to change your experience to line up with His Word? <laughs> and it was like, again, it was like this endless trump card of like, God, I just will never have enough faith for anything, and this sucks. Well, and no like, matter what your experience... But it's because of the system is what I'm trying yeah, to say. Yeah, exactly. But no, yeah, and, and to say... To say that statement is really such a false statement in itself because it's like no matter what your experience is, is changing your view of scripture. Mm -hmm. For example, someone in South America has a very different experience because they're raised in a very different culture. They're going to read scripture differently than us. Mm -hmm. Maybe not vastly differently. They're still going to believe Jesus died for their sins. There's like still basics, but I would say like, they're going to come away with different conclusions because they're being raised in a different environment too. Oh yeah. And so like the idea that we're divorced from ourselves and if you just read scripture purely, you'll get it. There is no way to read scripture purely. You are mm-hmm. a human with experiences, with stories, with people, with hurts. And with that's hopes. why it's a, and that's why it's a book that's not only, you know, inspired but it's human. Exactly. And I think and I think when you systematize it and again, systematic theology has done a lot of good things too. Totally. So, so, oh, so, yeah, yeah. so I don't want to just throw it all out and say like, oh, it's just evil, like or something like that. But I would say when you systematize it, it can totally strip it of its interactive elements and, and the fact that that it's alive. Yeah, and you we know what needed I mean? and we needed the the whole system thing like in the age of reason. Like, yeah. Oh, like you were saying, I thought that was really uh, really helpful to say like, yeah. I owe a lot to systematic theology, and I appreciate it, mm-hmm. and I still use it to some extent, but it's just... It's a tool in my tool, toolbox, yeah, but it's exactly. not the only tool. Right, yeah, It's yeah, a yeah. tool in my toolbox that helps me understand God, but it's not the only tool that helps me understand God. And sometimes I have to put that tool down because, you know, it, it might be good for certain things, but it can be destructive in other things. Right, right? totally. It might, be, it might be good a good tool in this area, but in this area it's going to cause a lot of harm. And I think that's where as a pastor I've had to learn that the hard way at times because yeah. the way we hold things can cause a lot of harm. But, man, hey, we're, 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 <laughs> we've been talking for like two hours. Jeez. Dude, we got to do this again. Uh, yeah. so, so today we talked about um, you know, atonement and... Non-violence. non-violence. Next time, maybe we can talk about sovereignty. Yeah. Because we really didn't get into that. But, like, that's no, a whole episode that's another in its own. Deal. Yeah. Right? That's a, one of those things that just kind of... the All of these things that we talked about are just... Um, they're intertwined. Inter, yeah, they're interlaced together. Yeah. We're both doing, like, the like the finger thing right now. <laughs> they're synergy. They mesh together. <laughs> so it's like you can't... You can't really... Uh, you can't you can't touch one without touching all the other ones. Yeah, you know but next I mean? time we'll focus on sovereignty a yeah. lot. I know we mentioned it, but like, so if you had to leave people with just one thought or idea or oh my you goodness, know, yeah. even a resource, whatever you want to do to kind of wrap Dude. it, you go ahead and wrap it the way you want. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, to me, like, just the idea, just the idea that like, um, God looks just like Jesus, and then I think it. I want to say it's Irenaeus, but I, or no, 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 I'm sorry, it was Irenaeus. It was Origen who said this, that if you find a picture of God in the Old Testament that does not, that's not worthy of what we see in Christ, mm. that we actually, we need to be patient and we need to sit with it and we need mm. to pray through it because there's always something going on behind the scenes that we don't see. Because like, for example, if you see something in the Old Testament where God doesn't look like he's manifesting the fruit of the Spirit, you know, I love joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, right? Gentleness, yeah. gentleness and self-control, right? Yeah. Like, if you don't see him doing that on the surface, well, then he's doing it behind the scenes. Yeah. How is he doing that? He's allowing the people of Israel to act in a certain way and even to misunderstand him mm. because he's being loving and patient and gentle and kind to them. So, like, yeah, God looks like Jesus. And, uh, <laughs> and when it doesn't look like he does, look closer and you can see, like, the fruit of the Spirit is going on there. Yeah. And uh and and then like probably the best resource for me, honestly, like I I get such a kick out of Greg Boyd. Like I can't yeah. I, I'm so grateful for that guy. I cannot only listen to him in general or only read him. Yeah. Just because I get 
too comfortable feeling like I know everything because it fits together <laughs> and I need other people that are just going to challenge that more mystical yeah. or more scientific or more whatever. But yeah. yeah, that's a really, that's been helpful. Yeah. Well, well good deal. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me, Justin. Yeah. Boom. Another episode in the books. I hope some of that was encouraging for you, maybe even challenging for you, or maybe it just helped you feel less crazy because you have real questions about God. It was great to have you with me today on Beyond Boundaries. If you want to learn more about me or find the show notes for this episode, you can go to pastorjustindouglas.com. You can interact with me there with feedback, comments, and questions, or you can reach out via Instagram at Pastor Justin Douglas. Please, as always, consider subscribing, rating, reviewing, and sharing. It really does make a difference, and I'm super thankful. May you go and live a life that is beyond boundaries, giving others love, exploring new ideas, and championing belonging.